This is ChestertonRadio.com. Ah, Miss Brooke. Yes, it's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks, under the direction of Al Lewis. Well, many of us are spending this Christmas Eve with our families and friends. But Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, isn't quite so fortunate. No, my family was too far away to visit, and it seems my friends had other plans. But I made up my mind not to brood about it, and I was trimming a rather tiny tree in our living room when Mrs. Davis, my landlady, joined me. That's quite a nice Christmas tree, Connie. It isn't really a Christmas tree, Mrs. Davis. It's called a friendship tree. You see, I trim it by putting all my greeting cards on the branches with strips of cellophane tape. Looks nice, doesn't it? Yes, it does. You certainly received some pretty cards this year. And the sentiments are so lovely. Look at this one I got from my principal. Mr. Conklin, what does it say, dear? It's very heartwarming, Mrs. Davis. It says, to Miss Brooks, may the coming year bring you much more efficiency in your work. (laughs) Signed, O. Conklin. Oh, I can hardly believe it's Christmas time again. What happy memories I have of the earlier Christmases. There was one I'll never forget. I was just eight years old, and when I tiptoed into the living room, there was my father standing by the tree. The minute he saw me, his eyes crinkled up, and he started to laugh so that his big white beard and his huge paunch just shook with glee. Your father was made up as Santa Claus? No, he always looked that way. <laughs> Do get back to the present, Connie. I'd love to stay here and celebrate Christmas Eve with you, but I promised my sister Angela I'd come over to her place. You remember Angela, the absent-minded one. Oh, certainly, Mrs. Davis. She always got a big thrill out of the holidays, too, even when we were girls. Of course, the poor dear could never remember when it was actually Christmas. And one Christmas day, she did the funniest thing. What was that, Mrs. Davis? What's that, dear? What did Angela do? Angela? Your sister. My sister. (laughs) The absent-minded one. (laughs) What did she do? Well, I haven't spoken to Angela in some time. What has she been up to? (laughs) I wish I knew. (laughs) Maybe I can refresh your memory. Christmas morning, Angela did the funniest thing. Christmas morning isn't until tomorrow, Connie. You must be confused. (laughs) Well, don't worry about it. I only get these spells once in a while. Well, you shouldn't let it go, Connie. If you don't mind my offering a little advice, I'd like to suggest that you train your mind to concentrate more. I'll do it, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> now then, I've developed a little scheme which works wonders for me. Supposing you have trouble remembering where you put things around the house. Well, you just keep repeating the location to yourself with a sort of rhythm. For example, I, I just chant to myself, the mustard's in the closet, the bread is in the box. The mustard's in the closet, the bread is in the box. Now, isn't that simple? Mustard's in the closet, bread is in the box. Wonderful, Mrs. Davis. If anybody wants a mustard sandwich, you're really ready. Yes. Now, uh, before I do anything else, I want to invite you to join me tonight. Join you? Yes, dear. I'm going over to... Uh, to, um... Angela's house. Oh, yes, that's right. Oh, she's so cute for that little absent mind of hers. Why, sometimes she forgets what she was talking about right in the middle of a... Oh, dear me, I hope there's enough milk for the cat. Well, I'm sure if we... But then maybe someday. Or if it doesn't seem to. And that's why I can't join you tonight. (laughs) But thanks anyway, Mrs. Davis. I'll just spend a quiet evening at home here. But how about Mr. Boynton? Don't tell me he was too shy to ask you for a date on Christmas Eve. Why do you think there's mistletoe on all four walls? <laughs> no, Mr. Boynton asked me all right, but then he canceled yesterday. Said he's going upstate to visit his folks for a couple of days. But don't worry about me, Mrs. Davis. I'll have a gay time. 
I'll listen to the radio, read, and from this window, I can see our neighbor's television antenna. <laughs> but what about the little gifts you got for Walter Denton and Mr. and Mrs. Conklin and Harriet? When are you going to deliver them? They told me not to bother. They said we'd exchange on the 26th. The 26th? But I don't think the day after Christmas is the time to exchange gifts. You don't. You should see the department stores. <laughs> What's that, Mrs. Davis? Oh, it's Minerva. Where are you, dear? Yeah. <laughs> oh, she's over by the trees. Here, Rover, a Minerva. <laughs> Isn't this the strangest thing how she bites at the pine needles? I guess the rosin in them appeals to her. I swear she likes the taste of it. I guess to her, it's like a Tom and Jerry. Or rather, a Minnie and a Mickey. <laughs> Come here, Minerva. We might as well get friendly. We're going to spend the evening together. Well, I'll be running along now, dear. I hope you won't feel too lonely. I'll be fine, Mrs. Davis. After all, I do have an imagination. I'll hang up my stocking in a little while. Then well, when I'm pretending I'm asleep, I'll sneak in and fill it. Before you know it, it'll be midnight. <sighs> Midnight of Christmas Eve. I can just picture it. A short, thin man in a black suit comes sliding down the chimney with an empty bag. St. Penniless, the school teacher, Santa Claus. <laughs> well, at least you're not bitter. Uh, now, Connie, about my sister, uh, Angela. Uh, oh, uh, thank you, dear. About my sister, Angela. Yeah? Good night, Dorothy. Good night, Bernice. <laughs> oh, stop drinking those pine needles, Minerva. Come over here. That's a good kitty. Now I'll just settle down in Mrs. Davis's rocker and we'll have ourselves a nice, quiet rock. <laughs> I've got to exercise more. My bones are rusting. <laughs> oh, it's the rocker. <laughs> it's kind of soothing. It's sad. You seem contented enough, Minerva. Yeah. <laughs> it was the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Yeah. Ooh, sorry, Minerva. <laughs> Gosh, I'm sleepy. <laughs> now, who can that be? Expecting anyone, Minerva? That's funny. Nobody's here. I'm here. Where? Oh, leaning on my knee. What can I do for you? <laughs> I'm a salesman, but I don't believe in giving any sales talk or sob stories. All I do is tell you what I'm selling. If you want to buy, okay. If not, okay. Okay? What are you selling? Well... Christmas Eve. I'm just a small urchin, a little on the underprivileged side. I'm trying to make a few dollars to get some wood to heat our tiny apartment. So while she's singing to my three sick sisters, my mother's lips don't turn blue. <laughs> That's what I like, no sob stories. If you're selling handkerchiefs, I'll take six. No, ma'am, I'm selling Christmas trees. They're only a dollar a piece. Oh, I've got, I've already got a tree. Then I'll make it 50 cents. But I don't need How about a quarter? Look, little boy. I can arrange payments. <laughs> Please take one, ma'am. These are ordinary trees, you know. They're magic. Magic? Yes, ma'am. You'd be surprised what miracles will happen if you buy one. Well, a quarter isn't too much to pay for a miracle. It's 50 cents. I thought you said 25. That's when you sounded tougher to sell. <laughs> Well, before I melt down to my coal buttons and the stovepipe hat, here's 50 cents. You won't be sorry, ma'am. Here's a little tree. Hey, it's kind of cute as that. Would you like to come in and help me set it up? Well, I can't. i got to get right home. My sitter's been alone long enough. Sitter? What about your mother and the firewood? That's just a routine. My folks are attending a dinner the other bank presidents are giving for father. 
With the pitch you've got, you'll have your own bank by the time you're 12. Thanks a lot. Good night, lady. Merry Christmas. Same to you, you little underprivileged millionaire. I'll put this tree over here. Maybe we can find some extra trimmings for it in the morning. Yeah. Minerva, will you stop gnawing on those pine needles? I wish I knew what made them so appetizing to us. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> now, you come here and let those things alone. There we are. Well, I guess I'm not the only one that's spending Christmas Eve alone without family or friends. But who can tell? Maybe Santa Claus has something up his big red sleeve that I don't even know about yet. Of course, I do have a squeaky rocker and Minerva. Jingle bells, jingle bells, and merry stuff like that. Oh, what fun it is to rock with a big fat drunken cat. <laughs> in the living room Christmas Eve with Minerva the cat on my lap, I couldn't help noticing that the tree which I'd bought from that wealthy urchin had a rather peculiar luminosity. Although there wasn't any artificial illumination, it seemed to glow from deep down in its branches. As I rocked back and forth, I started to get very drowsy. Oh, the little boy said this tree was magic, Minerva. <laughs> I don't believe it either. Still, it is Christmas Eve, and some very strange things have happened on Christmas Eve. Huh? What's that? Oh. oh. I must have been dozing. Coming! Well, it's Walter Denton. Come in, Walter. Come on into the living room, Walter. Thanks, Miss Brooks. Here, I brought you this little gift to put under your tree. Oh, that was very thoughtful, Walter. Put it under this tree over here. Okay. Say, you got two trees, haven't you? Yes, one for Minerva and one for me. Yeah. What? Don't pay any attention to her. She's pine needle happy. <laughs> well, Miss Brooks... As you know, I was supposed to spend the evening nestled snugly in the tight little confines of my own small, immediate family circle. For heaven's sakes, come out of there. You're giving me claustrophobia. <laughs> but I went to my father and mother and crowed their permission. Wait because... a minute, Walter. You crowed their permission? Yeah. Crave, crave, and crove, isn't it? Of course not. Crave, crave. Let's see. Crave, Craven. After you crowed their permission. <laughs> well, they waived my presence for a long enough while for me to deliver to you, Miss Brooks, the little token of my esteem and affection, which is now ensconcing under the tree. Walter, are you still in my English class? Sure, Miss Brooks. Well, I'd better bone up a little. One of us is going to flunk this term. <laughs> Miss Brooks, is something that I've wanted to say for a long time. Yes, Walter? It's a little on the sentimental side, perhaps, for a so-called pep high school boy to be telling the teacher, but it's sincere, Miss Brooks. I'm sure it is. It's something I feel deep down inside of me, Miss Brooks, from whence so many of one's warmer emotions stem. That's whence they stem from, all right. <laughs> Even if it does seem over-sentimental or even downright sticky, Christmas Eve seems to be the time you can say things like this and not sound over-sentimental or sticky. Christmas Eve is the time to say them. I just hope I hear them by New Year's Eve. <laughs> what I want you to know, Miss Brooks, is that I'm grateful. For what? For my association with you during the past semester at Madison High School. Well, thank you, Walter. I've tried to be a capable teacher. Oh, your sure teaching was nothing. <laughs> I don't mean galactically. As a teacher, you were very adequate. No, I mean personally. The interest you took in me and my problems. 
for that I could never thank you if I lived to be a hundred. Of course, you'd be gone a long time by then. <laughs> I owe Noel to you, too. You don't know what it's meant to me to have your ear whenever I needed it. It was nothing, really. I have another one. Especially about girls. Gosh, remember how silly I used to act about girls? Every time one of them looked at me, I giggled like a kid. And then, overnight, I matured. I met the one woman who mattered. Harriet Conklin. <laughs> I don't know what, but something. And you saw me through the difficult transition period of that amour as well, while Harriet and I were adjusting to one another. It was wonderful to be able to come to you for advice, Miss Brooks. It isn't every boy who has such an interest taken in him by some intelligent, elderly person. Give me back my ear. I can't hear you. It's not that you're ancient or anything. Gosh, I've seen girls who don't look as good as you do. Girls? What do you think I am? Yeah. Shut up, Minerva. <laughs> By the way, Miss Brooks, I see you got lots of mistletoe on the walls. Were you expecting Mr. Boynton tonight? Yes, Walter, I was. We were going for a wheelchair ride together. <laughs> but he had to visit his folks upstate. His folks? Gosh, they must be well along in years. His father's over 50. They may shoot him next spring. Look, <laughs> Walter, while you're here, you might as well pick up the little gift I got for you. Oh, but you shouldn't have, Miss Brooks. Where is it? <laughs> Under the tree on your right. It isn't much, just a remembrance. Oh, gee, I almost forgot. I can't open it yet. Why not? Oh, you mean you want to put it under your tree at home and open it with your family? Well, not exactly, but well, I'll get it later, Miss Brooks. <laughs> there they are now. I'll answer it. There who are now? Come on in, folks. She was all alone when I got here. And it's really a surprise, isn't it? We should have stayed home Christmas Eve. Besides, it's freezing out. Now, Osgood, don't be so grouchy. Hello, Miss Brooks. Merry Christmas. Why, it's Mr. and Mrs. Conklin and Harriet. How are you all? I'm cold. Oh, that's too bad. Come here, Minerva. Rub up against Mr. Conklin. Meow. What's that? What's that? Go away, cat. She seems to like you, Osgood. Or or is she hungry, Miss Brooks? She's not that hungry. <laughs> I don't like cats. Why doesn't you go chase a mouse or something? You forget, Mr. Conklin. This is Christmas Eve. There isn't one staring. <laughs> Yes, Walter? There's a lot of mistletoe around this room. I know. It's real pretty. Osgood, notice all the mistletoe in this room? What? Oh, that green stuff. <laughs> oh, no, not. It makes me sneeze. Oh, come on, Osgood. Let's see if it does. Oh, now, Martha, don't embarrass me. I don't... It the... doesn't make you sneeze, does it, Harriet? I'm willing to find out. Here's a nice wreath of it on this wall. Yeah. Well, here we are. <laughs> yes, here we are. <laughs> May I ask you, Mrs. Conklin? If it's all right with Harriet, it's all right with us. Oh, come on, Walter. We're getting old. Oh, gosh, you're sweet, Harriet. Isn't that cute, Osgood? Oh, come here, dear. How about one for your faithful old wife? Well, it is customary, I guess. There. I'm under the stuff. <laughs> now, Parker, up to you. Very well, very well. Now, as you see, I, I told you. I, ah! <laughs> now, let's stop this romantic dribble and act like adult human beings. Miss Brooks, I'd like to take advantage of this visit to inquire as to your plans for the coming year's classwork. Do you have your schedule all laid out? Frankly, Mr. Conklin, I haven't had much chance to work on anything. I haven't had much of a chance, but you've been away from school all week. Your vacation started last Monday. I know, Mr. Conklin, and that's what I took the week as. I mean, a vacation is something you go on when you get the opportunity to. 
You don't work on it or during it, unless, even though I didn't actually go anywhere, when my vacation came along, I went on it, or was on one, usually. And you wanted to be the head of the English department. Please, Osgood, this is no time to talk of school affairs. We're here to spend part of our holiday with Miss Brooks. It was very nice of you to think about me, Mrs. Conklin. It was nice of all of you. I want to... Where are Walter and Harriet? Denton, get my daughter away from that mistletoe at once. Well, Mr. Conklin, Harriet isn't allergic to mistletoe. No, but I'm allergic to you. <laughs> Harriet's almost irresistible sometimes. Especially alongside older women like Mrs. Conklin and Miss Brooks. <laughs> Sounds like the bell. I'll get it. Why, Mr. Boynton, come in. Sure, thanks, Miss Brooks. But I thought you were going upstate to see your folks. I was, but they sent me a wire that they wanted to come here for about a week or so. They'll arrive in the morning, so I thought I'd drop this little gift off for you tonight. Oh, but you shouldn't have. Where is it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just put it under the tree in the living room. Look who's here, everybody. Well, it's Mr. Boynton. Hi there, Mr. B. This is nice. Oh, uh, Boynton, pretty cold out, isn't it? <laughs> This is beginning to get more like Christmas Eve every minute. Sit down, Mr. Boynton. I'm certainly glad your folks decided to visit you instead of vice versa. Well, so am I. There's a particularly good reason why I'm glad. There is? Yes. It gives me a chance to see how my guinea pigs are affected by this cold snap. <laughs> well, they, they haven't reacted at all. What do you expect them to do? Blow on their paws? <laughs> Have you pointed out the mistletoe to Mr. Boynton? Oh, why don't you stop that nonsense, Martha? It isn't nonsense. Mr. Boynton, look at the mistletoe. Uh, mistletoe? Oh, oh, yes. A very interesting example of the flora found in various areas throughout the globe. <laughs> An evergreen parasitic shrub, it is indigenous to the regions where apple trees and oaks abound. Now that the lecture is over, may we ask questions? Certainly, Miss Brooks. Want to stand under it? Stand under it? Well, you see, because of certain characteristics in its makeup, an allergy is sometimes aggravated by its presence. I'll take a chance if you will. Come on, Mr. Boynton. Yeah, come on, Mr. Boynton. Just bring him over to this wall here. Well, I'll get under it if you like. Well, don't just stand there. Can't you see Miss Brooks is cooking? Well, don't fuss for me. I couldn't eat a thing. the mistletoe signifies? Well, I know what it signifies to most people, but, but to me, it's just... It, it, it... <laughs> well, there goes 85 cents worth of mistletoe. I know what let's do. Let's open up the presents right now. Wow. Oh. Splendid suggestion, Walter. Uh, shouldn't we wait until just before we leave? Might be less embarrassing that way. Well, if you want to open them now... Sally, this one tree's pretty crowded. I'll put some of these packages under this little one over here. Hey, look out, Walter. You're bumping into one of the branches. Look out! <laughs> Gosh, I got the funniest feeling when I touched that branch. What kind of a feeling, Walter? Well, you... You're Harriet Conklin, aren't you? Well, sure, I'm Harriet Conklin. Walter, what's the matter with you? Nothing. Nothing's the matter with me. It's just that I want to tell you something. Harriet, you've got to change. You want to try to be more like Miss Brooks. Well, what do you mean, Walter? If you want me to stay interested in you, you've got to be more alluring, youthful, glamorous, feminine in that real feline Brooks way. <laughs> Walter, have you been drinking pine needles, too? Look at that tree. It, it seems to be glowing. What do you mean, glowing? It's just a reflection from the streetlight. This party's giving me the Mimi. <laughs> Holidays, indeed. Here, I'll just move the tree where it won't glisten in our eyes. Here we go. <laughs> ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas! <laughs> of course I'm Mr. Conklin. Happy-go-lucky, fun-loving, gag-a-minute Osgood. <laughs> 
a minute, Osgood. Sometimes I've wanted to. Brooke, you suddenly look so different, so intelligent. Miss Brooks? I have made up my mind. You are now head of the Madison High English Department. Ha, 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 ha. Well, thank you, fun-loving Osgood. Uh. To put this wonderful tree where it belongs, right in the center of the room. Give me a hand, Boynton. Yes, sir, Mr. Conklin. I'll just take this hand here and. <laughs> Miss Brooks? Yes, Mr. Boynton? Come here, baby. <laughs> Come here, Connie. He did not. He said, come here, baby, and I'm here. Look, he's taking her over to the mistletoe. Oh, isn't it wonderful? What are you going to do, Mr. Boynton? Just call me Phil, Connie. And this is what I'm going to do. State, Miss Brooks? I know why, Mr. Boynton. Your folks are coming down to see you. How did you know that? I just got the telegram. Uh, don't let's get too carried away with the holidays. We've got to prepare for a hard school season ahead, Miss Brooks. Oh, let's not talk about school affairs now, Osgood. Walter, look at the mistletoe. Yeah, look at it. Now, just a minute. Before we go through all that again, <laughs> would you please touch the tree, Mr. Boynton? The one on the left with the... Why, it's gone. There's only one tree. Miss Brooks, are you all right? Of course I'm all right. Could I have dreamt that part, too? Mr. Boynton, would you do me a favor, please? Well, of course, Miss Brooks. What is it? Would you touch the Christmas tree? Touch it? Please, I... it's important. Well, all right. There. Nothing happened. <laughs> what did you expect would happen? A miracle. Excuse me, I'll be right back. I want to learn, Shuttle. I'm selling magic Christmas trees. But you just came here. Please buy one, lady. They only cost 50 cents a piece. 50 cents? That's right. Here's two dollars. Give me four of them. Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay and luster cream shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden. episode of Our Miss Brooks, written by Al Lewis. Well, the holiday season is practically with us. To Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, it means more than just a respite from the rigors of a difficult school term. Yes, it means that I'll get a chance to relax and observe the change that takes place in people as Christmas approaches. It's almost visible, the spirit of camaraderie and warm good fellowship which flows between us like a bountiful stream. I only hope that this season, our beloved principal, Mr. Osgood Conklin, will get a little on him. <laughs> I was talking about his temper to my landlady last Friday morning at breakfast. I can't understand it, Mrs. Davis. Everything I do lately seems to rub Mr. Conklin the wrong way. What do you mean, Connie? Well, take yesterday, for instance. I was in his office when I saw his lighted cigar lying on the rug unnoticed. Naturally, I stooped over and picked it up. Wouldn't you? Well... I gave up smoking a long time ago. <laughs> but, uh, I 
didn't want the office to catch on fire, Mrs. Davis. So I merely put the cigar in an ashtray. You might not believe this, but he was furious. Because you put his cigar back in the ashtray? Well, it wasn't exactly an ashtray. I guess I should have noticed it was an inkwell. <laughs> oh, and when you put his cigar in the inkwell, it went out? That isn't the end I put in the inkwell. <laughs> Three puffs later, Mr. Conklin could have won first prize in the chow dog contest. <laughs> He's so unreasonable. You'd think having a blue tongue was a crime. Maybe it was the taste of the ink he objected to. He's always been a finicky eater anyway. <laughs> but forget about Mr. Conklin, Connie. Just stay out of his way as much as possible. Believe me, I'll do my best, Mrs. Davis. Hey, that's quite a batch of mail you've got there. Is it all for you? Mail? Oh, this isn't incoming mail, Connie. These are the letters I picked up from all the kids in the neighborhood. You see, um, Bush's department store has a contest each year in which the child who writes the best letter to Santa Claus gets his choice of anything in the toy department. Oh, and you're Santa's helper. Mm -hmm. Well, I shop there anyway, so I just drop them off for the kids. They write such cute letters, some of them. Reminds me of the one you wrote to Santa when you were seven years old. Me? Where did you see that, Mrs. Davis? Forgive me, Connie, but I've got it right here. I took it out of your old album. You know, the scrapbook with the souvenirs in it. You had it out last night. Remember? Oh, that's right. I thought I might run across some souvenir money in it. <laughs> Let's see the letter, Mrs. Davis. Here you are, dear. Read it out loud. I get such a kick out of it. All right. It says, Dear Sandy Claus, look at this spelling, S-A-N-D-Y-C-L-A-W-S-S-S. -S -S -S. <laughs> That's nice, one S for each claw. Read on, dear. I don't want you to bring me very much toys at all, because then you would not have enough for all the other little children. Wasn't I a doll? <laughs> Please, Sandy, just bring me a slate with some chalk and a eraser and some crayons and a ruler on account, because when I grow up, I want to be a English teacher. Signed, Connie Brooks, age seven. <laughs> Isn't that touching, Mrs. Davis? Even at that tender age, I was already planning my future poverty. <laughs> You knew what you wanted, all right. Now, I'll just set these letters on the sideboard and pour us some coffee. Here's your cup, Connie. Thanks, Mrs. Davis. I'd better hurry. Walter Denton is picking me up this morning. Can we give you a lift? No, thank you. I'm going over to Bush's department store. They have a contest each year in which a child who writes the best letter to Santa Claus gets a... Um, His choice um, of anything in the toy department? How did you know, Connie? <laughs> you just finished telling me, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> oh, so I did. Now, where in the world did I put those letters? What have you done to your car, Walter? Seems to have quite an air about it this morning. It's nothing but your own aromatic presence, Miss Brooks. <laughs> well, thanks, Walter, but I'm not what I mean. Wait a minute, here's a cigar on the seat between us. Oh, probably dropped out of my dad's pocket. I drove him to work this morning. Say, hey, do you mind if I keep it? It might make a nice good morning gesture to Mr. Conklin. I can use one at this point. Oh, sure. My dad's got a pocket full of cigars. But what's wrong with you and old Marblehead? <laughs> Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Are you in the doghouse, Miss Brooks? Where I am shouldn't happen to a dog, Walter. <laughs> but maybe this little peace offering will help. Smells awfully sweet for a cigar. Oh, it isn't the cigar that has that sweet smell, Miss Brooks. That's Miss Enright. Where is she sitting? In the glove compartment? <laughs> no, I just dropped her off at the beauty parlor. She was wearing a new perfume. She said it was called Voodoo. Kind of clings to the upholstery, doesn't it? <laughs> just like Miss Enright. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Walter. I shouldn't speak that way about another member of the faculty. Forget I said anything. Oh, sure. I know there's no love lost between you two. Although, Miss Enright did pay you a rather nice compliment this morning. She did? Yes, ma'am. She said she thought it was wonderful how you taught the subject of English. Miss Enright said that? Just before she went into the beauty parlor. She said that anybody who could teach a language to so many kids for such a long time, in spite of her obvious difficulty in speaking that language, should get a medal. <laughs> Maybe the dryer will fall on her. <laughs> By the way, Walter, did Miss Enright mention her reason for going to the beauty parlor so early in the morning? Oh, come to think of it, she did. 
She said she was going out with Mr. Boynton after school. But today's Friday, the day Mr. Boynton usually takes me to the zoo. Well, it's also a special occasion for Miss Enright. It's her birthday. Can you know something, Miss Brooks? She came right out and told me your age. How old did she say she was, Walter? Twenty-seven. I guess that's why Mr. Boynton has to take her out today instead of you. I still don't see what Miss Enright's birthday has to do with it. He didn't take her out last year when she was 27. <laughs> or the year before when she was 28. Ah, uh, 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 Miss Brooks, I seem to detect the presence of the green-eyed monster in this vehicle. She can't possibly be back from the beauty parlor yet. <laughs> just makes me mad, Walter, the way some women try to keep their ages hidden. Why, if anybody wanted to make it their business, they could find out my age in a minute. How old are you, Miss Brooks? None of your business. <laughs> There's Mr. Conklin going into his office, Miss Brooks. Now's your chance to slip in that cigar. Right, Walter. See you in class. Uh, good morning, Mr. Conklin. Good morning, Miss Brooks. Have a cigar? Cigar? Yes, sir. I just happen to have it on me. That is, <laughs> a gentleman friend left it in my compact. Uh, here. <laughs> it's brand new. No ink on it. <laughs> Thanks, Miss Brooks. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll withdraw to the safety of my office while I'm still ahead. Yes, sir. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Conklin. Goodbye. Good morning, Miss Brooks. Hello, Miss Enright. Walter Denton tells me that today's your birthday. Well, yes, darling, it is. Happy birthday. And I shall bask in the warmth of that greeting all day. Well, I'm sorry, Miss Enright, but I don't think it's fair of you to make Mr. Boynton break a date with me just because it's your birthday. Oh, I didn't make him do anything, Miss Brooks. It's obviously a matter of preference. Put down a brightly colored gay silk scarf and an old gray shoe, and even a baby will reach for the scarf. Are you calling me an old gray shoe? <laughs> well, if it fits, darling, slip it on. <laughs> Now, look, Miss Enright, I don't want to be rude to you on this of all days, especially since I realize that your birthday is one holiday which has been celebrated in this neighborhood for countless generations. <laughs> but every Friday, Mr. Boynton takes me to the zoo. That's very cooperative, my dear, but if the zoo wants you badly enough, they'll come and get you. <laughs> Excuse me, I've got to find Walter Denton's car. I left a cigar in the front seat this morning. Oh, was that your cigar? I thought you smoked the pipe. <laughs> it's for Mr. Boynton. He's just a big overgrown boy when it comes to practical jokes, you know, so I bought that cigar for him in the magic shop. In the magic shop? Yes. It's an exploding cigar. <laughs> Dangerous, of course, just full of soot. Oh, no. Excuse me, Miss Enright, but I've got to get back to Mr. Conklin's office right away. Mr. Conklin, about that cigar I gave you, sir. Yes, Miss Brooks? Oh, God! <laughs> Mr. Conklin, are you all right? Why, yes. Yes, <laughs> I'm just dandy. <laughs> but there's soot all over my face. What do you suggest I do about that? What can you do, Mr. Conklin? Get down on one knee and sing April Showers. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith. Now, proof that brushing teeth right after eating with Colgate Dental Cream helps stop tooth decay before it starts. Continuous research, hundreds of case histories, makes this the most conclusive proof in all dentifrice research on tooth decay. Eminent dental authorities supervised hundreds of college men and women for over two years. One group always brushed their teeth with Colgate right after eating. The other followed their usual dental care. The group using Colgate Dental Cream is directed. Using Colgate's exclusively showed a startling reduction in average number of cavities, far less tooth decay. The other group developed new cavities at a much higher rate. No other dentifrice offers proof of these results. Modern research shows decay is caused by mouth acids, which are at their worst right after eating. Brushing teeth, it says directed, helps remove acids before they harm enamel. Yes, Colgate's contains all the necessary ingredients, including an exclusive patented ingredient for effective daily dental care. So remember, always use Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth. 
and help stop tooth decay. Well, I finally convinced Mr. Conklin that the cigar episode should be included in my list of unpremeditated crimes. Then when lunch period dragged itself around, I hastened to the cafeteria to see if Miss Enright was with Mr. Boynton. She wasn't, so in four seconds flat, I was. (laughs) I waited all during lunch for him to break our date for that afternoon, but he remained strangely silent. So while we were drinking our coffee, I summoned all my feminine wiles and subtly remarked, Is I is or is I ain't your baby? (laughs) What did you say, Miss Brooks? Nothing, Mr. Boynton. Here's a napkin. It's just that I get a distinct feeling of guilt emanating from your side of the table. Uh, Guilt? What makes you say that? You paid for my coffee. It's all right. You can pay for mine next time. I paid for yours last time. We're even. (laughs) But today is Friday, Mr. Boynton. Is that right? That's right. And we usually go to the zoo on Friday. Isn't that so? Yes, that's so. Well? Well, what? Is I is or is I ain't your baby? (laughs) If you mean am I keeping our engagement, Miss Brooks, well, a a funny thing happened this morning. On your way to the rabbit's cage? (laughs) Yes. As a matter of fact, I was in my lab when it happened. I remembered an appointment I made for this afternoon with somebody else. Namely? My, uh, uh, my grandmother. Uh, that's it. My, my grandmother came into town unexpectedly this morning, and I promised to take her out for the day. She's, uh, she's rather helpless, you see, because, well, she's quite far along in years. You're not just clacking your crockery, Doc. <laughs> it so happens, Mr. Boynton, that I know your grandmother. Y- you do? Yes, she's 27 years old, and she teaches English at Madison High School. Miss Brooks, I've decided that rather than stoop to deception, I'd better be honest about this thing. (laughs) What I told you just now about my grandmother, it isn't true. No. (laughs) No, I I made a date with Miss Enright for today, but only because it's her birthday, Miss Brooks. She she told me her folks were living in another part of the country. My folks live in another part of the country. Well, Miss Enright also said she didn't have too many friends. I don't have too many friends. But Miss Enright is 27 years old today. My folks live in another part of the country. (laughs) Sorry, Miss Brooks. I just didn't want your feelings to be hurt. Don't worry about my feelings, Mr. Boynton. I've sent away for a plastic set. Hi, Miss Brooks, Mr. Boynton. Hello, Harriet. How are you, Harriet? Would you care to sit down? There's plenty of room at this table. Oh, thanks just the same, Mr. Boynton, but I've got to take this container of coffee to Daddy. Oh, is your father lunching in his office, Harriet? Yes. He says he's too embarrassed to eat in public today. There seems to be something on his neck he can't get off. The Board of Education? (laughs) It's some black stuff. He didn't want to talk about it too much. Here, Harriet, let me take that coffee down to him. It's the least I can do. You sit here and chat with Mr. Boynton, dear. He's very good company today, loaded with stories. (laughs) Well, all right, Miss Brooks, if you say so. Here's the coffee, and here's some extra sugar. Daddy likes it plenty sweet. Thanks, Harriet. I'll, uh, I'll see you later, won't I, Miss Brooks? As we both get older, you mean? <laughs> Please drop into my lab after school. Maybe we can work something out. Perhaps we can all have a date together. Fine. I'll bring my grandfather for Miss Enright. Come in. Uh, I met your daughter in the cafeteria, Mr. Conklin, and she gave me this coffee to bring you. What happened to her? Pull up lame? <laughs> Well, as a matter of fact, sir, I wanted to sort of atone for some of my earlier transgressions. Well, don't stand there. Pour some coffee in a cup for me, please. Yes, sir. I'll just get this cover off. It's on pretty tight. Well, I hope it's hot. If there's anything I can't stand, it's cool coffee. Oh, I'm sure it's piping hot, Mr. Conklin. I can tell by the way the container feels. Lid is so... Let me let me help you. Let me... No, it's coming now. I... Oh, yes! oh! Is piping hot. Isn't it? <laughs> Observe the steam rising from my trousers when you <laughs> Miss Brooks, yesterday you dipped my cigar in the inkwell. This morning you gave me one that exploded in my face. And now, thanks to you again, a container of hot coffee is running down my leg. <laughs> Well, don't stand there, Miss Brooks. What have you to say for yourself? 
Is it sweet enough, Mr. Conklin? <laughs> if it isn't Miss Brooks, come in. <laughs> I said come in. You are Osgood Conklin? I am. No doubt you heard of Bush's department store. I have. Well, I'm Bush. I'm a little pooped myself. <laughs> Out. Yeah, I'll be brief, Mr. Conklin. Each year, my store gives away contest prizes to children who write in the best letters to Santa Claus. Now, we like to choose some prominent citizens in our community to play Santa for this occasion. Hence, my visit here. Uh, my dear Mr. Bush, if you're suggesting that I involve myself in the squalling clamor of hundreds of children in a department store, put it out of your mind. Uh, but, Mr. Conklin... You we... have no way of knowing this, of course, but I'm a person with extremely high blood pressure and acute hypertension. Playing Santa to a band of yowling brats is out of the question. But I've invited all the photographers and reporters, Mr. Conklin. You'll get, at the very least, a two-column picture in every paper. I'm sorry. It's absolutely unthinkable for me to... 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 Uh, two-column picture? <laughs> of course. You see, we've picked the winning letter, and you're the ideal choice to present the grand prize this afternoon. Why me? Because you're a school principal. And the contest winner is a little seven-year-old girl who wants to be a teacher when she grows up. A teacher? Well, I guess I can arrange it. I'd hate to disappoint a child, especially this obviously backward little tyke. <laughs> what time shall I be there, Mr. Bush? Uh, four o'clock sharp, please. And thank you so much for accepting our invitation. You're welcome, I'm sure. Now, if you'll excuse me, sir, I must inspect some new gym equipment that just arrived. Of course, Mr. Conklin. Oh, before I leave your office, may I use the phone? Uh, certainly. It's right there on my desk. I'll see you at four, Mr. Bush. Right, thank you. Santa Claus is coming to town. <laughs> Hello, this is Davis speaking. Oh, this is Mr. Bush of Bush's department store. My secretary gave me your phone number, Mr. Davis. Told me what a grand job you've done of rounding up the children's letters in our Letter to Santa contest. I was glad to help, Mr. Bush. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Now, there's just one bit of information I need from you. Do you know where, uh, Connie Brooks lives? Connie Brooks? Certainly. She lives right here with me. Well, that's a coincidence. Could I speak with her? Not now. She's still in school. <laughs> of course. It's not three o'clock yet. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I was just getting ready to pick her up. One of the students in school with her usually takes her home, but he's busy today. I see. Well, Miss Davis, you can do me a great favor. Instead of taking her home today, bring Connie right over to our store. What for? You'll see. What kind of toys does she favor, Mrs. Davis? Toys. Connie doesn't play with toys. Oh, the serious type, eh? <laughs> well, bring her over as early as you can, Mrs. Davis, so I can get acquainted with her. She'll probably warm up a bit after a nice romp in the sand pile. <laughs> Now, remember, Mrs. Davis, don't tell her why she's coming to the store. I'd like it to be a surprise. It'll be a surprise, all right. Now, will you please tell me what we're doing in Bush's department store, Mrs. Davis? I haven't enough money left to buy a Christmas seal, let alone do any shopping. Be patient, Connie. We'll find out as soon as I can locate Mr. Bush. I know. Let's cut out for the sand pile. It's right over there in the toy department. All right, but I... Oh, look, there's Mr. Boynton. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks, Mrs. Davis. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Excuse me just a moment, won't you? I'll go on ahead, Connie, and find Mr. Bush. Fine, Mrs. Davis. Well, Mr. Boynton, doing a little last-minute Christmas shopping? Oh, not exactly, Miss Brooks. Miss Enright asked me to come over here right after school. She's, uh, she's crazy about children, she says, and they're having some sort of contest here today. Where is she now? Oh, she's in the hardware department picking up a new roaster. She says next to children, she likes nothing better than cooking and housework. I bet she's terribly decent to animals, too. <laughs> I, I'm sorry I didn't see you after school, but Miss Enright insisted we leave at once. After all, it is... Her birthday today, I know, Mr. Boynton. I had a hunch you two would wind up alone. Oh, we're only going to a movie, Miss Brooks. Donald O'Connor in Francis just opened at the state. It's the story of an army mule. Oh? That's where you're taking Miss Enright? That's right. What are you trying to do, start your own mule train? <laughs> I just got the most charming pot, darling. Oh, you've acquired one of your own, haven't you, Mr. Barnes? <laughs> Hello, Mr. Barnes. 
Hello, Prudence. <laughs> Cooked any interesting children lately? <laughs> Please, ladies, please, let's get over to the toy department. They're getting ready for the ceremonies. The spotlight was just turned on that platform. Oh, fine, Mr. Boynton. I just adore toys. Well, why don't you act your age? <laughs> Come along, Miss Brooks. I see Mrs. Davis right in the front row. Attention! Attention! Quiet, please, children. Quiet, children. Quiet. Here, without further ado, is your old friend, Santa Claus. Oh, 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 oh. Merry Christmas, kiddies. Why, that's Mr. Conklin. Is it really? Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> of course. I'd recognize that bloodthirsty cheerfulness anywhere. <laughs> Here you are, Santa. Here's the prize-winning letter in the contest. I suppose you read it out loud and will surprise the author, who I know is among those listening. Surely, surely. <clears throat> <clears throat> it says, Dear Sandy Claus... Spelled C L A W S S S. That's nice. One S for each cloth. <laughs> I don't want you to bring me very much toys at all, because then you would not have enough for all the other little children. Isn't she a doll? <laughs> Wait a minute. This sounds awfully familiar. Please, Sandy, just bring me a slate with some chalk and a eraser and some crayons and a ruler, because when I grow up, I want to be a English teacher. Oh, no. Signed, Connie Brooks, age seven. <laughs> now, if this little girl will step up... <laughs> Connie Brooks! Like you know this girl, Mr. Conklin. Well, let's get her up to the platform. Where are you, honey? You, Mr. Bush, down here. I'm Mrs. Davis. Oh, hello, Mrs. Davis. The girl you're looking for is standing right here beside me. What? Who are you? I'm Connie Brooks, age seven. <laughs> Miss Brooks, what's the meaning of this? Yes. What is this hoax? Oh, there was no hoax intended, gentlemen. Mrs. Davis must have absentmindedly put my letter in with the other kids. When I wrote that letter, I was actually seven years old. You were never that young, darling. <laughs> oh, this is terrible. The press and photographers will be here any minute. Give me that bag of toys, Mr. Conklin. This girl gets nothing. Now, hold on there, Mr. Bush. The contest rules clearly state that the winner must be a child. If Miss Brooks was seven years old when she wrote that letter, she, she's entitled to take home anything she wants from the toy department. Yes. I think you've got something there, Mr. Boynton. Oh, uh, this is terribly embarrassing. Miss Brooks, if you'll just leave the premises before the press arrive, you may have anything in the toy department you desire. What do you want? Uh, Mr. Bush, this is Mr. Boynton. Wrap him up. <laughs> Martin returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight? Yes, tonight. Show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Luster cream, world's finest shampoo. No other shampoo in the world gives K. Dumas magic blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Not a soap, not a liquid. Luster cream shampoo leaves hair three ways lovelier. Fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable. Even in hardest water, luster cream lathers instantly. No special rinse needed after a luster cream shampoo. So gentle, luster cream is wonderful even for children's hair. Tonight, yes, tonight, try luster cream shampoo. Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. You, your crowning glory, too, a luster cream shampoo. And now, once again, here is Eve Arden. This Christmas, give yourself and your family the gift that keeps on giving, United States savings bonds, the present with the future. And buy savings bonds regularly. Start preparing now for those things you know you're going to want and need in the future. If you're on a regular payroll, use the Easy Payroll Savings Plan. If you're self-employed, use the bond-a-month plan. Invest today in security, your own economic security and the security of your country. Buy United States savings bonds today. 
Eventually, turn into another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Luster Cream Shampoo, the soft, glamorous, caressable hair, and Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Boynton is played by Jeff Chandler, Mr. Conklin by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, Mary Jane Croft, and Hal March. Here's good shaving news. Three men out of every four can get more comfortable, actually smoother shaves with Plum Olive Brushless Shaving Cream. This is not just a claim. Here's the proof. 1,297 men tried the Plum Olive Brushless Way to Shave described on the tube. And no matter how they shaved before, three men out of every four got more comfortable... Actually, smoother shaves. Try Plum Olive Brushless yourself. See if you don't get more comfortable. Actually, smoother shaves the proved Plum Olive Brushless way. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting fun-packed adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evening over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at this same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. Another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks, written by Al Lewis. Well, most of us spent Christmas Eve with our families and friends. But Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, wasn't quite so fortunate. No, my family was too far away to visit, and it seems my friends had other plans. But I made up my mind not to brood about it, and was trimming a rather tiny tree in our living room when my landlady, Mrs. Davis, joined me. What a nice tree, Connie. It isn't really, Mrs. Davis, but it's the only one I could afford. Oh, what did you pay for it? I found it in a vacant lot. (laughs) What I like about it is the size. It's not too big or too small. It's just too small. (laughs) I'd like to stay here and celebrate Christmas Eve with you, Connie, but I promised my sister Angela I'd come over to her place. Do you remember Angela? The absent-minded one. Oh, certainly, Mrs. Davis. She always got a big thrill out of the holidays, even when we were girls. Of course, the poor dear could never remember when it was actually Christmas. And one Christmas morning, she did the funniest thing. What's that, Mrs. Davis? What's what, dear? (laughs) What did Angela do? Angela. (laughs) Your sister. My sister. The absent-minded one. What did she do? I haven't spoken to Angela in some time. What did she been up to? That's what I'd like to know. Maybe I can refresh your memory. Christmas morning, Angela did the funniest thing. Christmas morning isn't until tomorrow, Connie. <laughs> you must be confused. Well, don't worry about it. I only get these spells once in a while. (laughs) Well, you shouldn't let it go, Connie. If you don't mind my offering a little advice, I'd like to suggest that you train your mind to concentrate more. I'll do it, Mrs. Davis. (laughs) Now, I've developed a little scheme which works wonders for me. Supposing you have trouble remembering where you put things around the house. Well, you just keep repeating the location to yourself with a sort of rhythm. For example, I just chant to myself, the must is in the closet, the bread is in the box. The must is in the closet, the bread is in the box. The must is in the closet, the bread is in the box. Now, isn't that simple? The oh. must is in the closet, the bread is in the box. That's wonderful, Mrs. Davis. If anybody wants a mustard sandwich, you're really ready. Yes. Now, uh, before I do anything else, I want to invite you to join me tonight. Join you? Yes, dear. I'm going over to, uh, uh, to, uh... Angela's house. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> She's so cute with that little absent mind of hers. <laughs> Sometimes she forgets what she's talking about right in the middle of a sentence. And, uh, oh, dear me, I hope that cat's got enough milk. 
Well, I'm sure if we, uh... But then, maybe someday... Or if it doesn't seem to... And that's why I can't join you tonight. <laughs> Thanks anyway, Mrs. Davis. I'll just spend a quiet evening at home here. But how about Mr. Boynton? Don't tell me he was too shy to ask you for a date on Christmas Eve. Why do you think there's mistletoe on all four walls? <laughs> no, Mr. Boynton asked me all right, but then he canceled yesterday. Said he's going upstate to visit his folks for a couple of days. But don't worry about me, Mrs. Davis. I'll have a gay time. I'll listen to the radio, read, and from this window I can see our neighbor's television antenna. <laughs> What about the little gifts you got for Walter Denton and Mr. and Mrs. Conklin and Harriet? When are you going to deliver them? Oh, they told me not to bother. They said we'd exchange on the 26th. The 26th? But I don't think the day after Christmas is the time to exchange gifts. You don't? You should see the department stores. <laughs> What's that, Mrs. Davis? It's Minerva. Where are you, dear? <laughs> oh, she's over by the tree. <laughs> Here, Rover, uh, Minerva. <laughs> Isn't it the strangest thing how she bites at the pine needles? I guess the rosin in them appeals to her. I swear she likes the taste of it. I guess to her it's like a Tom and Jerry, or rather a Minnie and Mickey. <laughs> come on, Minerva, come on over here. We might as well get friendly. We're going to spend the evening together. <laughs> well, I'll be running along now, dear. I hope you won't feel too lonely. Oh, I'll be fine, Mrs. Davis. After all, I do have an imagination. I'll hang my stocking up in a little while, and then when I'm pretending that I'm asleep, I'll sneak in and fill it. <laughs> oh, before you know it, it'll be midnight. Midnight of Christmas Eve. I can just picture it. A short, thin man in a black suit comes sliding down the chimney with an empty bag. St. Penniless, the school teacher, Santa Claus. <laughs> You're not bitter. Now, Connie, about my... Uh, my sister, uh... Angela. Uh, oh, thank you, dear. About my sister, Angela. Yes? Good night, Dorothy. <laughs> Good night, Bernice. <laughs> drinking those pine needles, Minerva. Come on over here. There's a good kitty. Now I'll just settle down in Mrs. Davis's rocker and we'll have ourselves a nice, quiet rock. I've got to exercise more. My bones are rusting. <laughs> oh, it's the rocker. Kind of soothing at that. <sighs> you seem contented enough, Minerva. It was the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. <laughs> Sorry, Minerva. I didn't mean to upset you, Minerva. Oh, gosh, I'm sleepy. Now, who can that be? Expecting anyone, Minerva? That's funny. There's nobody here. I'm here. Where? Oh, leaning on my knee. <laughs> What can I do for you? Well, I'm a salesman, but I don't believe in giving any sales talk or sob stories. All I do is tell you what I'm selling, and if you want to buy, okay, if not, okay. Okay? What are you selling? Well, it's Christmas Eve, and I'm just a small urchin, a little on the underprivileged side, and I'm trying to make a few dollars to get some wood to heat our tiny apartment so that while she's singing to my three sick sisters, my mother's lips don't turn blue. <laughs> That's what I like, no sob stories. <laughs> You're selling handkerchiefs, I'll take six. Oh, no, ma'am, I'm selling Christmas trees. It's only a dollar apiece. But I've already got a Christmas tree. Then I'll make a 50 cents. But I don't need... How about to... a quarter? Look, little boy. Well, payments can be arranged. <laughs> oh, please take one, ma'am. These aren't ordinary trees, you know. They're magic. Magic? Yes, ma'am. You'd be surprised what miracles will happen to you if you buy one. Well, a quarter isn't too much to pay for a miracle. It's 50 cents. <laughs> I thought you said 25. That's when you sounded tougher to sell. Uh, oh. 
Well, before I melt down to my cold buttons and the stovepipe hat, here's 50 cents. Well, you won't be sorry, ma'am. Here is a little tree. Say, it is kind of cute at that. Would you like to come in and help me set it up? I can't. I've got to get right home. My sitter's been alone long enough. Sitter? <laughs> well, what about your mother and the firewood? Well, that's just a routine. My folks are attending a dinner the other bank presidents are given for father. <laughs> The pitch you've got, you'll have your own bank by the time you're 12. Oh, that's a lot. Good night, lady, and Merry Christmas. Same to you, you little underprivileged millionaire. <laughs> oh, I'll put this tree over here. Maybe we can find some extra trimmings for it in the morning. Yeah. Minerva, will you stop gnawing on those pine needles? I wish I knew what made them so appetizing to her. Now, you come over here and let those things alone. There we are. Well, I guess I'm not the only one that's spending Christmas Eve alone without family or friends. But who can tell? Maybe Santa Claus has something up his big red sleeve that I don't even know about yet. Of course, I do have a squeaky rocker and Minerva. Jingle bells, jingle bells and merry stuff like that. Oh, what fun it is to rock with a big, fat, drunken cat. As I sat in the living room Christmas Eve with Minerva the Cat on my lap, I couldn't help noticing that the tree which I'd bought from that wealthy urchin had a rather peculiar luminosity. Although there wasn't any artificial illumination, it seemed to glow from deep down in its branches. As I rocked back and forth, I started to get very drowsy. Ooh, little boy said this tree was magic, Minerva. No, I don't believe it either. Still, it is Christmas Eve, and... Some very strange things have happened on Christmas Eve. <sighs> hmm? What, what, what's that? Oh, I, I must have been dozing. Coming! It's Walter Denton. Come in, Walter. Noel, Noel. Joy, you is Noel. Gracias. Come on into the living room, Walter. Oh, thanks, Miss Brooks. Here, I brought you this little gift to put under your tree. Oh, that was very thoughtful, Walter. Put it under this tree over here. Okay. Say, you've got two trees, haven't you? Yes, one for Minerva and one for me. What? Don't pay any attention to her. She's pine needle happy. <laughs> Well, Miss Brooks, as you know, I was supposed to spend the evening nestled snugly in the tight little confines of my own small immediate family circle. Oh, for heaven's sakes, come out of there. You're giving me claustrophobia. <laughs> but I went to my father and mother and crowed their permission to come over... Wait a to... minute, Walter. You crowed their permission to... <laughs> yeah. Crave, craven, crow, isn't it? <laughs> oh, Walter, of course not. Crave, crave... Let's see. Crave, Craven. After you crowed their permission, what happened? Well, they waited my presence for a long enough while for me to deliver to you, Miss Brooks, the little token of my esteem and affection, which is now ensconcing under the tree. Walter, are you still in my English class? Well, sure, Miss Brooks. Well, I'd better bone up a little. One of us is going to flunk this term. Well, it isn't just a gift, Miss Brooks. That's not the only thing that brought me wayfaring from the warmth and conviviality of my own heart. Oh, please don't start that again. I'm glad you dropped over, Walter. And if you want to spend the rest of the evening with your folks, oh, why you Oh, no go... rush with them. They've got my present under our tree already. Now, what I'd like to say, Miss Brooks, though, is something I've wanted to say for a long while. Yes, Walter? Now, it's a little on the sentimental side, perhaps, for a so-called pep high school boy to be telling a teacher, but it's sincere, Miss Brooks. I'm sure it is. It's something I feel deep down inside of me, Miss Brooks, from whence so many of one's warmer emotions stem. 
That's whence they stem from, all right. <laughs> of course, even if it does seem over-sentimental or even downright sticky, Christmas Eve <laughs> seems to be the time that you can say things like this and not sound over-sentimental or sticky. Christmas Eve is the time to say them. I just hope I hear them by New Year's Eve. <laughs> what I want you to know, Miss Brooks, is that I'm grateful. For what, Walter? For my association with you during the past semester at Madison High School. Well, thank you, Walter. I've tried to be a capable teacher. Oh, your teaching was nothing. What? <laughs> oh, I don't mean scholastically. No, as a teacher, you were very adequate. I mean personally. The interest you took in me and my problems. For that, I could never thank you if I lived to be a hundred. Of course, you'd be gone a long time by then. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you, too. You don't know what it's meant to me to have your ear whenever I needed it. Oh, there's nothing, really. I have another one. Especially about girls. Because you remember how silly I used to act about girls? Every time one of them looked at me, I giggled like a kid. And then, overnight, I matured. I met the one woman who really mattered. Harriet Conklin. <laughs> something out of you, Walter. I don't know what, but something. You, you saw me through the difficult transition period of Adam Moore as well. While Harriet and I were adjusting to one another, it was wonderful to be able to come down to you for advice, Miss Brooks. It isn't every boy who has such an interest taken in him by some intelligent elderly person. Give me back my ear. I can't hear you. Not that you're ancient or anything. Gosh, I've seen girls who don't look as good as you do. Girls? What do you think I am? Yeah. Shut up, Minerva. <laughs> By the way, Miss Brooks, I see you got lots of mistletoe on the wall. Were you expecting Mr. Boynton tonight? Yes, Walter, I was. We were going for a wheelchair ride together. <laughs> he had to visit his folks upstate. His folks? Gosh, they must be well along in years. His father's over 50. They may shoot him next spring. <laughs> Look, Walter, while you're here, you might as well pick up the little gift I got for you. Oh, but Miss Brooks, you shouldn't have. Where is it? <laughs> Under the tree on your right. It isn't much, just a remembrance. Oh, gee, I almost forgot. I can't open it yet. Why not? Oh, you mean you want to put it under your tree at home and open it with your family. Oh, not exactly, but... Oh, I'll get it later, Miss Brooks. Oh, there they are now. I'll answer it. There who are now? Come on in, folks. He was all alone when I got here. But it's really a surprise, isn't it? We should have stayed home Christmas Eve. Besides, it's freezing out. Now, Oscar, don't be so grouchy. Hello, Miss Brooks. Merry Christmas. Why, it's Mr. and Mrs. Conklin. And Harriet, how are you all? I'm cold. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Come here, Minerva. Rub up against Mr. Conklin. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? What are you... Go away, cat. Why, she seems to like you, are good. Or is she hungry, Miss Brooks? She's not that hungry. I don't like cats. Why doesn't she go chase a mouse or something? Oh, you forget, Mr. Conklin, this is Christmas Eve. There isn't one stirring. Uh, hey, Harriet, see yes, us, Walter? There's a lot of mistletoe around this room. I know. It's real pretty. Ah, good. Notice all the mistletoe in this room? What? Oh, oh, that green stuff. Yeah. More often than not, it makes me sneeze. Oh, come on, Osgood. Let's see if it does. Oh, now, Martha, don't embarrass me. It doesn't make I... you sneeze, does it, Harriet? I'm willing to find out. Here's a nice wreath of it on this wall. Yeah. Well, here we are. <laughs> yeah. Here we are. Mr. and Mrs. Conklin, if it's all right with Harriet, it's all right with us. Oh, come on, Walter. We're getting old. <laughs> Gosh, you're sweet, Harriet. Oh, isn't that cute, Osgood? Come here, dear. How about one for your faithful old wife? Well, it is customary, I guess. <laughs> uh, I'm under the stuff. Up, dear. Very well. Yes. Yes. I. You see, I. 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 
I told you. Ah! I'll get it. Why, Mr. Boynton, come in. Oh, thanks, Miss Brooks. I thought you were going upstate to see your folks. Well, I was, but they sent me a wire that they wanted to come down here for a week or so. They'll arrive in the morning, so I thought I'd drop this little gift off for you tonight. Oh, but you shouldn't have. Where is it? <laughs> Let's just put it under the tree in the living room. Look who's here, everybody. Well, it's Mr. Boynton. Hi there, Mr. B. This is nice. Hello, Boynton. <laughs> Hello, folks. This is beginning to get more like Christmas Eve every minute. Sit down, Mr. Boynton. I'm certainly glad your folks decided to visit you instead of vice versa. Oh, so am I. There's a particularly good reason why I'm glad. There is? Oh, yes. It gives me a chance to see how my guinea pigs are affected by this cold snap. <laughs> so far, they haven't reacted at all. What do you expect them to do, blow on their paws? <laughs> Miss Brooks, have you pointed out the mistletoe to Mr. Boynton? Oh, why don't you stop that nonsense, Martha? Uh, it isn't nonsense. Mr. Boynton, look at the mistletoe. Mistletoe? Oh, oh, yes. A very interesting example of the flora found in various areas throughout the globe. <laughs> An evergreen parasitic shrub, it is indigenous to the regions where apple trees and oaks abound. Now that the lecture is over, may we ask questions? Well, certainly, Miss Brooks. Want to stand under it? <laughs> stand under it? Well... Oh, you see, because of certain characteristics in its makeup, an allergy is sometimes aggravated by its presence. I'll take a chance if you will. Come on, Mr. Boynton. Yeah, come on, Mr. Boynton. Uh, just bring him over to this wall here. Uh, I'll get under it if you like. Well, don't just stand there. Can't you see Miss Brooks is cooking? Well, don't fuss for me. I couldn't eat a thing. <laughs> Mr. Boynton... Don't you know what standing under the mistletoe signifies? I know what it signifies to most people, but to me it's just... <laughs> well, there goes 85 cents worth of mistletoe. Hey, I know what let's do. Let's open up the presents right now. Well, a splendid suggestion, Walter. Uh, uh, shouldn't we wait until just before we leave? Might be less embarrassing that way. Well, if you want to open them now... Oh, I this them. one tree is pretty crowded. I'll put some of these packages under this little one over here. Look out, Walter. You're bumping into one of the branches. Look out! Gosh, I got the funniest feeling when I touched that branch. What kind of a feeling, Walter? Oh, it... You're Harriet Conklin, aren't you? Well, sure, I'm Harriet Conklin. Walter, what's the matter with you? Nothing. Nothing's the matter with me. It's just that I want to tell you something. Harriet, you've got to change. You want to try to be more like Miss Brooks. Well, what do you mean, Walter? If you want me to stay interested in you, you've got to be more alluring, useful, glamorous, feminine in that real feline Brooks way. <laughs> Walter, have you been drinking pine needles, too? <laughs> Look at that tree. It, it seems to be glowing. What do you mean, glowing? Just a reflection from the streetlights. This party is giving me the memes. <laughs> Holidays, indeed. Here, I'll just move the tree where it won't glisten in our eyes. There we go. <laughs> Merry Christmas! Why, oh, Mr. Conklin. Of course I'm Mr. Conklin. Happy-go-lucky, fun-loving, gag-a-minute Osgood. <laughs> gag-a-minute Osgood? Sometimes I've wanted to. <laughs> Miss Brooks, is that really you standing there? I think so, Mr. Conklin. Why do you ask? Because you suddenly look so different. So intelligent. <laughs> Miss Brooks, I've made up my mind. You are now head of the Madison High English Department. Well, thank you, fun-loving Osgood. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put this wonderful tree where it belongs. Right in the center of the room. Give me a hand, Boynton. Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Cochran. I'll just take this hand here and... Miss Brooks. Yes, Mr. Boynton? Come here, baby. <laughs> what? I said, come here, Connie. You did not. You said, come here, baby, and I'm here. <laughs> He's taking her over to the mistletoe. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Well, 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 what are you going to do, Mr. Boynton? Uh, just call me Phil, Connie. 
And this is what I'm going to do. make you feel? Oh, I feel like I'm in a dream, Phyllis. A wonderful, beautiful dream. Well, what's that? Mr. Boynton, where did you go? Where is everybody? Oh, I must have been dreaming. Well, that's real enough. I'll be right there. Oh, sorry, Minerva. I didn't mean to drop you. I'm cold. <laughs> Why, it's the Conklins and Walter and Mr. Boynton. But you all just left. Uh, I mean, come in. We thought it would be nice if we spent our Christmas Eve together, Miss Brooks. Yes. And we've brought a few little gifts over for you. I'll just put them under this tree here. Yes, do that, Walter. Uh, aren't you going to ask me why I didn't go upstate, Miss Brooks? I know why, Mr. Boynton. Your folks are coming down to see you. Well, how did you know about that? I just got the telegram. Uh, don't let's get too carried away with the holidays to prepare for the hard school season ahead, Miss Brooks. Oh, let's yes. not talk about school affairs now, Osgood. Walter, look at the mistletoe. Yeah. Look at it. Now, just a minute. Before we go through all that again, <laughs> would you please touch that tree, Mr. Boynton? The one on the left of the... Why, it's gone. There's only one tree. Miss Brooks, are you all right? Of course I'm all right. Could I have dreamt that part, too? Uh, Mr. Boynton, would you do me a favor, please? Of course, Miss Brooks. What is it? Would you touch the Christmas tree? Touch it? But... Please, it's important. Oh, all right. There. Nothing happened. Well, what did you expect would happen? A miracle. Oh, excuse me. I'll be right back. Oh, I'm a little merchant, and I'm selling magic Christmas trees. But you just... Please buy one, lady. They only cost 50 cents apiece. 50 cents? That's right. Here's two dollars. Give me four of them. <laughs> The Colgate Palmolive Peat Company, makers of Luster Cream Shampoo and Colgate Dental Cream, bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. And we should like to open our show with greetings and best wishes from Colgate Palmolive Peat for a gloriously Merry Christmas. And now, Our Miss Brooks. <laughs> time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks, under the direction of Al Lewis. Well, many of us are spending this Christmas Eve with our families and friends, but Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, isn't quite so fortunate. No, my family was too far away to visit, and it seems my friends had other plans. But I made up my mind not to brood about it, and I was trimming a rather tiny tree in our living room when Mrs. Davis, my landlady, joined me. That's quite a nice Christmas tree, Connie. It isn't really a Christmas tree, Mrs. Davis. It's called a friendship tree. You see, I trim it by putting all my greeting cards on the branches with strips of cellophane tape. Looks nice, doesn't it? Yes, it does. You certainly received some pretty cards this year. And the sentiments are so lovely. Look at this one I got from my principal. Mr. Conklin, what does it say, dear? It's very heartwarming, Mrs. Davis. It says, to Miss Brooks... May the coming year bring you much more efficiency in your work. <laughs> Signed, O. Conklin. Oh, I can hardly believe it's Christmas time again. What happy memories I have of the earlier Christmases. There was one I'll never forget. I was just eight years old, and when I tiptoed into the living room, there was my father standing by the tree. The minute he saw me, his eyes crinkled up and he started to laugh so that his big white beard and his huge paunch just shook with glee. Your father was made up as Santa Claus? No, he always looked that way. <laughs> but do uh, get back to the present, Connie. I'd love to stay here and celebrate Christmas Eve with you, but I promised my sister Angela I'd come over to her place. You remember Angela, the absent-minded one. Oh, certainly, Mrs. Davis. She always got a big thrill out of the holidays, too, even when we were girls. Of course, the poor dear could never remember when it was actually Christmas. And one Christmas day, she did the funniest thing. What was that, Mrs. Davis? What's what, dear? 
What did Angela do? Angela? Your sister. My sister. <laughs> the absent-minded one. <laughs> what did she do? Well, I haven't spoken to Angela in some time. What has she been up to? <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> Maybe I can refresh your memory. Christmas morning, Angela did the funniest thing. Christmas morning isn't until tomorrow, Connie. You must be confused. <laughs> well, don't worry about it. I only get these spells once in a while. Well, you shouldn't let it go, Connie. If you don't mind my offering a little advice, I'd like to suggest that you train your mind to concentrate more. I'll do it, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> now then, I've developed a little scheme which works wonders for me. Supposing you have trouble remembering where you put things around the house. Well, you just keep repeating the location to yourself with a sort of rhythm. For example, I, I just chant to myself, the mustard's in the closet, the bread is in the box. The mustard's in the closet, the bread is in the box. Now, isn't that simple? Mustard's in the closet, bread is in the box. <laughs> That's wonderful, Mrs. Davis. If anybody wants a mustard sandwich, you're really ready. <laughs> yes. Now, uh, before I do anything else, I want to invite you to join me tonight. Join you? Yes, dear. I'm going over to... Uh, to, um... Angela's house. Oh, yes, that's right. Oh, she's so cute with that little absent mind of hers. Why, sometimes she forgets what she was talking about right in the middle of a... Oh, dear me, I hope there's enough milk for the cat. Well, I'm sure if we... But then maybe someday. Or if it doesn't seem to. And that's why I can't join you tonight. <laughs> but thanks anyway, Mrs. Davis. I'll just spend a quiet evening at home here. But how about Mr. Boynton? Don't tell me he was too shy to ask you for a date on Christmas Eve. Why do you think there's mistletoe on all four walls? <laughs> no, Mr. Boynton asked me all right, but... Then he canceled yesterday. Said he's going upstate to visit his folks for a couple of days. But don't worry about me, Mrs. Davis. I'll have a gay time. I'll listen to the radio, read. And from this window, I can see our neighbor's television antenna. <laughs> but what about the little gifts you got for Walter Denton and Mr. and Mrs. Conklin and Harriet? When are you going to deliver them? They told me not to bother. They said we'd exchange on the 26th. The 26th? But I don't think the day after Christmas is the time to exchange gifts. You don't. You should see the department stores. <laughs> <laughs> What's that, Mrs. Davis? Oh, it's Minerva. Where are you, dear? Meow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's over by the tree. Here, Rover. I'm a Minerva. <laughs> Isn't it the strangest thing how she bites at the pine needles? I guess the rosin in them appeals to her. I swear she likes the taste of it. I guess to her it's like a Tom and Jerry. Or rather a Minnie and a Mickey. <laughs> Come here, Minerva. We might as well get friendly. We're going to spend the evening together. Well, I'll be running along now, dear. I hope you won't feel too lonely. I'll be fine, Mrs. Davis. After all, I do have an imagination... I'll hang up my stocking in a little while. Then well, when I'm pretending I'm asleep, I'll sneak in and fill it. Before you know it, it'll be midnight. Uh, midnight of Christmas Eve. I can just picture it. A short, thin man in a black suit comes sliding down the chimney with an empty bag. St. Penniless, the schoolteacher, Santa Claus. <laughs> well, at least you're not bitter. Uh, now, Connie... About my sister, uh... Angela. Uh, oh, thank you, dear. About my sister, Angela. Yeah? Good night, Dorothy. Good night, Bernice. <laughs> oh, stop drinking those pine needles, Minerva. Come over here. That's a good pity. Now, I'll just settle down in Mrs. Davis's rocker and we'll have ourselves a nice, quiet rock. <laughs> I've got to exercise more. My bones are rusting. <laughs> oh, it's the rocker. <laughs> kind of soothing, is that? 
You seem contented enough, Minerva. <laughs> it was the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. <laughs> Ooh, sorry, Minerva. I didn't mean to upset you. <laughs> oh, gosh, I'm sleepy. <laughs> now, who can that be? Expecting anyone, Minerva? That's funny. Nobody's here. I'm here. Where? Oh, leaning on my knee. What can I do for you? <laughs> I'm a salesman, but I don't believe in giving any sales talk or sob stories. All I do is tell you what I'm selling. If you want to buy, okay. If not, okay. Okay? What are you selling? Well, it's Christmas Eve. I'm just a small urchin, a little on the underprivileged side. I'm trying to make a few dollars to get some wood to heat our tiny apartment. So while she's singing to my three sick sisters, my mother's lips don't turn blue. <laughs> That's what I like, no sob stories. <laughs> if you're selling handkerchiefs, I'll take six. No, ma'am, I'm selling Christmas trees. They're only a dollar apiece. Oh, I've, got, I've already got a tree. Then I'll make it 50 cents. But I don't need How a tree. How about a quarter? Li- Look, little boy. I can arrange payments. <laughs> Please take one, ma'am. These aren't ordinary trees, you know. They're magic. Magic? Yes, ma'am. You'd be surprised what miracles will happen if you buy one. Well, a quarter isn't too much to pay for a miracle. It's 50 cents. I thought you said 25. That's when you sounded tougher to sell. (laughs) Oh. Well, before I melt down to my coal buttons and the stovepipe hat, here's 50 cents. You won't be sorry, ma'am. Here's a little tree. Say, it's kind of cute at that. Would you like to come in and help me set it up? No, I can't. I gotta get right home. My sitter's been alone long enough. Sitter? What about your mother and the firewood? That's just a routine. My folks are attending a dinner the other bank presidents are giving for father. (laughs) With the pitch you've got, you'll have your own bank by the time you're 12. Thanks a lot. Good night, lady, and Merry Christmas. Same to you, you little underprivileged millionaire. (laughs) I'll put this tree over here. Maybe we can find some extra trimmings for it in the morning. Yeah. Minerva, will you stop gnawing on those pine needles? I wish I knew what made them so appetizing to her. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> now you come here and let those things alone. There we are. Well, I guess I'm not the only one that's spending Christmas Eve alone without family or friends. But who can tell? Maybe Santa Claus has something up his big red sleeve that I don't even know about yet. Of course, I do have a squeaky rocker and Minerva. Jingle bells, jingle bells and merry stuff like that. Oh, what fun it is to rock with a big fat drunken cat. in the living room Christmas Eve with Minerva the cat on my lap, I couldn't help noticing that the tree which I'd bought from that wealthy urchin had a rather peculiar luminosity. Although there wasn't any artificial illumination, it seemed to glow from deep down in its branches. As I rocked back and forth, I started to get very drowsy. Oh, the little boy said this tree was magic, Minerva. No. I don't believe it either. Still, it is Christmas Eve, and some very strange things have happened on Christmas Eve. Huh? What's that? Oh. Oh, I must have been dozing. Coming! Well, it's Walter Denton. Come in, Walter. No, well, no, well, Joy, you... No, well. <laughs> Gracias. Come on into the living room, Walter. Uh, thanks, Miss Brooks. Here, I brought you this little gift to put under your tree. Oh, that was very thoughtful, Walter. Put it under this tree over here. Okay. Say, so you got two trees, haven't you? Yes, one for Minerva and one for me. Yeah. What? Don't pay any attention to her. She's pine needle happy. <laughs> oh. 
Well, Miss Brooks, as you know, I was supposed to spend the evening nestled snugly in the tight little confines of my own small, immediate family circle. For heaven's sakes, come out of there. You're giving me claustrophobia. <laughs> but I went to my father and mother and crowed their permission. Wait because... a minute, Walter. You crowed their permission? Yeah. Crave, crave, and crove, isn't it? Of course not. <laughs> crave, crave. Let's see. Crave, craven. After you crove their permission. <laughs> well, they waved my presence for a long enough while for me to deliver to you, Miss Brooks, the little token of my esteem and affection, which is now ensconcing under the tree. Walter, are you still in my English class? Sure, Miss Brooks. Well, I'd better bone up a little. One of us is going to flunk this turn. <laughs> well, what I'd like to say, Miss Brooks, is something that I've wanted to say for a long time. Yes, Walter? It's a little on the sentimental side, perhaps, for a so-called Kef high school boy to be telling the teacher, but it's sincere, Miss Brooks. I'm sure it is. It's something I feel deep down inside of me, Miss Brooks, from whence so many of one's warmer emotions stem. That's whence they stem from, all right. Of course, even if it does seem over-sentimental or even downright sticky, Christmas Eve seems to be the time you can say things like this and not sound over-sentimental or sticky. Christmas Eve is the time to say them. I just hope I hear them by New Year's Eve. Well, what I want you to know, Miss Brooks, is that I'm grateful. For what? for my association with you during the past semester at Madison High School. Well, thank you, Walter. I've tried to be a capable teacher. Oh, your teaching was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean scholastically. As a teacher, you were very adequate. I mean personally. The interest you took in me and my problems. For that, I could never thank you if I lived to be a hundred. Of course, you'd be gone a long time by then. <laughs> I owe Noel to you, too. You don't know what it's meant to me to have your ear whenever I needed it. It was nothing, really. I have another one. <laughs> Especially about girls. Gosh, remember how silly I used to act about girls? Every time one of them looked at me, I giggled like a kid. And then, overnight, I matured. I met the one woman who mattered. Harriet Conklin. <laughs> She certainly made something out of you, Walter. I don't know what, but something. And you saw me through the difficult transition period of that amour as well, while Harriet and I were adjusting to one another. It was wonderful to be able to come to you for advice, Miss Brooks. It isn't every boy who has such an interest taken in him by some intelligent, elderly person. Give me back my ear. I can't hear you. Well, not that you're ancient or anything. Gosh, I've seen girls who don't look as good as you do. Girls? What do you think I am? Yeah. Shut up, Minerva. <laughs> By the way, Miss Brooks, I see you got lots of mistletoe on the walls. Were you expecting Mr. Boynton tonight? Yes, Walter, I was. We were going for a wheelchair ride together. <laughs> but he had to visit his folks upstate. His folks? Gosh, they must be well along in years. His father's over 50. They may shoot him next spring. <laughs> Look, Walter, while you're here, you might as well pick up the little gift I got for you. Oh, but you shouldn't have, Miss Brooks. Where is it? <laughs> Under the tree on your right. It isn't much, just a remembrance. Oh, gee, I almost forgot. I can't open it yet. Why not? Oh, you mean you want to put it under your tree at home and open it with your family? Well, not exactly, but well, I'll get it later, Miss Brooks. Oh, there they are now. I'll answer it. There who are now? Hey, come on in, folks. She was all alone when I got here. But it's really a surprise, isn't it? We should have stayed home Christmas Eve. Besides, it's freezing out. Now, Osgood, don't be so grouchy. Hello, Miss Brooks. Merry Christmas. Why, it's Mr. and Mrs. Conklin and Harriet. How are you all? I'm cold. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Come here, Minerva. Rub up against Mr. Conklin. What's that? What's that? Go away, cat. She seems to like you, Osgood. Or, or is she hungry, Miss Brooks? 
She's not that hungry. I don't like cats. Why doesn't she go chase a mouse or something? You forget, Mr. Conklin. This is Christmas Eve. There isn't one stirring. <laughs> Say, Harriet. Yes, Walter? There's a lot of mistletoe around this room. I know. It's real pretty. Osgood, notice all the mistletoe in this room? What? Oh, that green stuff. <laughs> More often than not, it makes me sneeze. Oh, come on, Osgood. Let's see if it does. Oh, now, Martha, don't embarrass me. I don't it like that. It doesn't make you sneeze, does it, Harriet? I'm willing to find out. Here's a nice wreath of it on this wall. Yeah. Well, here we are. <laughs> yes, here we are. <laughs> If it's all right with Harriet, it's all right with us. Oh, come on, Walter. We're getting old. Oh, gosh, you're sweet, Harriet. Isn't that cute, Osgood? Oh, come here, dear. How about one for your faithful old wife? Well, it is customary, I guess. There, I'm under the stuff. <laughs> now pluck her up, dear. Very well, very well. I, I, you see, I, I told you. I t- ah, <laughs> Now, let's stop this romantic dribble and act like adult human beings. Miss Brooks, I'd like to take advantage of this visit to inquire as to your plans for the coming year's classwork. Do you have your schedule all laid out? Frankly, Mr. Conklin, I haven't had much chance to work on anything. haven't had much of a chance, but you've been away from school all week. Your vacation started last Monday. I know, Mr. Conklin, and that's what I took the week as. I mean, a vacation is something you go on when you get the opportunity to. You don't work on it or during it, unless, even though I didn't actually go anywhere, when my vacation came along, I went on it, or was on one, usually. (laughs) And you wanted to be the head of the English department. Please, Osgood, this is no time to talk of school affairs. We're here to spend part of our holiday with Miss Brooks. It was very nice of you to think about me, Mrs. Conklin. It was nice of all of you. I want to... Where are Walter and Harriet? Denton, get my daughter away from that mistletoe at once. Well, Mr. Conklin, Harriet isn't allergic to mistletoe. No, but I'm allergic to you. <laughs> Harriet's almost irresistible sometimes, especially alongside older women like Mrs. Conklin and Miss Brooks. Sounds like the bell. I'll get it. Why, Mr. Boynton, come in. Well, thanks, Miss Brooks. But I thought you were going upstate to see your folks. I was, but they sent me a wire that they wanted to come here for about a week or so. They'll arrive in the morning, so I thought I'd drop this little gift off for you tonight. Oh, but you shouldn't have. Where is it? (laughs) (laughs) Let's just put it under the tree in the living room. Look who's here, everybody. Well, it's Mr. Boynton. Hi there, Mr. B. This is nice. Hello, Boynton. Pretty cold out, isn't it? (laughs) Hello, folks. This is beginning to get more like Christmas Eve every minute. Sit down, Mr. Boynton. I'm certainly glad your folks decided to visit you instead of vice versa. So am I. There's a particularly good reason why I'm glad. There is? Yes. It gives me a chance to see how my guinea pigs are affected by this cold snap. (laughs) So far, they, they haven't reacted at all. What do you expect them to do? Blow on their paws? Brooks, have you pointed out the mistletoe to Mr. Boynton? Oh, why don't you stop that nonsense, Martha? It isn't nonsense. Mr. Boynton, look at the mistletoe. Mistletoe? Oh, oh, yes. A very interesting example of the flora found in various areas throughout the globe. <laughs> An evergreen parasitic shrub. It is indigenous to the regions where apple trees and oaks abound. Now that the lecture is over, may we ask questions? Certainly, Miss Brooks. Want to stand under it? (laughs) Stand under it? Well, you see, because of certain characteristics in its makeup, an allergy is sometimes aggravated by its presence. I'll take a chance if you will. Come on, Mr. Boynton. Yeah, come on, Mr. Boynton. Just bring him over to this wall here. Well, I'll get under it if you like. Well, don't just stand there. Can't you see Miss Brooks is cooking? Well, don't fuss for me. I couldn't eat a thing. (laughs) Don't you know what 
what standing under the mistletoe signifies? Well, I know what it signifies to most people, but but to me, it's... it's, it's... (laughs) Well, there goes 85 cents worth of mistletoe. (laughs) I know what let's do. Let's open up the presents right now. Well, a splendid suggestion, Walter. Uh, Shouldn't we wait until just before we leave? Might be less embarrassing that way. Well, if you want to open them now... Golly, this one tree's pretty crowded. I'll put some of these packages under this little one over here. Well, look out, Walter. You're bumping into one of the branches. Look out. <laughs> Gosh, I got this funny feeling when I touched that branch. What kind of a feeling, Walter? Well, you... You're Harriet Conklin, aren't you? Well, sure, I'm Harriet Conklin. Walter, what's the matter with you? Nothing. Nothing's the matter with me. It's just that I want to tell you something. Harriet, you've got to change. You ought to try to be more like Miss Brooks. Well, what do you mean, Walter? If you want me to stay interested in you, you've got to be more alluring, youthful, glamorous, feminine in that real feline Brooks way. (laughs) Walter, have you been drinking pine needles, too? Look at that tree. It, it seems to be glowing. What do you mean, glowing? It's just a reflection from the street light. This party's giving me the Mimi. <laughs> Holidays, indeed. Here, I'll just move the tree where it won't glisten in our eyes. Here we go. <laughs> ho, ho, ho! <laughs> Merry Christmas! <laughs> Of course I'm Mr. Conklin. Happy-go-lucky, fun-loving, gag-a-minute Osgood. <laughs> gag-a-minute Osgood? Sometimes I've wanted to. <laughs> Miss Brooks, is that really you standing there? I think so, Mr. Conklin. Why do you ask? Because you suddenly look so different, so intelligent. Miss Brooks, <laughs> I have made up my mind. You are now head of the Madison High English Department. Ha, 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 ha. Well, thank you, fun-loving Oz. Uh, I'm going to put this wonderful tree where it belongs, right in the center of the room. Give me a hand, Boynton. Well, yes, sir, Mr. Cockman. I'll just take this end here and... <laughs> Miss Brooks? Yes, Mr. Boynton? Come here, baby. <laughs> I said, come here, Connie. You did not. You said, come here, baby, and I'm here. Look, he's taking her over to the mistletoe. Isn't it wonderful? What are you going to do, Mr. Boynton? Just call me Phil, Connie. And this is what I'm going to do. Make you feel. I feel like I'm in a dream, Philip. A wonderful, beautiful dream. Mr. Boynton. Mr. Boynton. Mr. Boynton, where are you? Where did everybody go? Oh, I must have been dreaming. Well, that's real enough. I'll be right there. Oh, sorry, Minerva. I didn't mean to drop you. Merry Christmas, Miss Roy. Sorry, Christmas. I'm cold. <laughs> Why, it's the Conklins and Walter and Mr. Boynton. But you all just left. I mean, come in. We thought it would be nice if we spent our Christmas Eve together, Miss Brooks. Yes, and we've brought a few little gifts over for you. Now, I'll just put them under this tree here. Yes, do that, Walter. Aren't you going to ask me why I didn't go upstate, Miss Brooks? I know why, Mr. Boynton. Your folks are coming down to see you. How did you know that? I just got the telegram. Uh, don't let's get too carried away with the holidays. We've got to prepare for a hard school season ahead, Miss Brooks. Oh, let's not talk about school affairs now, Osgood. Walter... Look at the mistletoe. Yeah, look at it. Now, just a minute. Before we go through all that again, would you please touch the tree, Mr. Boynton? The one on the left with the... Why, it's gone. There's only one tree. 
Miss Brooks, are you all right? Of course I'm all right. Could I have dreamt that part, too? Mr. Boynton, would you do me a favor, please? Well, of course, Miss Brooks. What is it? Would you touch the Christmas tree? Touch it? Please, I, I... it's important. Oh, all right. There. Nothing happened. What did you expect would happen? A miracle. Excuse me, I'll be right back. I'm a little urchin, and I'm selling magic Christmas trees. But you just came Please here... Please buy one, lady. They only cost 50 cents apiece. 50 cents? That's right. Here's two dollars. Give me four of them. <laughs> Once again, here is Eve Arden. From the bottom of my heart, to you in the audience, to you in every home, on every road, in every city and town, in the busy places and in the lonely places, oh, a very Merry Christmas to each of you. With our sponsor, the Colgate Palm Olive Peat Company, who make luster cream shampoo and Colgate dental cream, all of us here in the studio have gathered to wish all of you throughout our beautiful and bountiful land the most joyous of Christmases. And may these words ring round the world and sink deep in the heart of everyone. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Merry, Merry Christmas, everyone. For mystery liberally printed with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North. Tune in Tuesday evening over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. Stay tuned now for Jack Benny. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> it's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks under the direction of Al Lewis. Well, the schools have been closed during the Christmas vacation. And our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, has spent hers quite enjoyably. Yes, indeed. During the days preceding Christmas, there was the thrill of wondering what kind of gifts I'd receive. Then, in the days following, there's been the thrill of wondering what I'd get in exchange for the Christmas gifts I receive. <laughs> By last Thursday, though, I had made up my mind and paid a visit to the exchange counter of Sherry's department store. Pardon me, are you in charge here? Yes, ma'am. Dale is the name. Rex Dale. And who might you be? I might be Mrs. Boynton if I keep my New Year's resolution. <laughs> right now, the name is Constance Brooks. Several of my friends have purchased gifts here that I'd like to exchange. I see. First of all, there's the plastic monstrosity in this box. <laughs> that doesn't seem quite the way to talk about a gift from a friend, Miss Brooks. This happens to have been presented to me my, by my principal, Mr. Conklin. And believe me, it's terrifying. <laughs> no Christmas present freely given should be referred to as terrifying. Here, I'll open the box for you. There. <laughs> what in the world is it? It's a figure of Atlas carrying a globe. Only the globe is built in the shape of a round house which tells the changes in the weather by a small man and woman who pop out of their respective doors when you least expect them. But what's this on the back of the figure? He seems to have a red spine. That's a thermometer. And dangling from the thermometer is a small alarm clock. Oh, <laughs> oh now I recall this item. It must be quite popular. The gentleman who bought it ordered six of them. He said it was given to several members of the faculty. Well, there must be some place you could use it. Mr. Dale, this sort of thing was old-fashioned when Grandma was a girl. Where could it possibly fit in the modern home? Well, let's see. Do you have a fireplace in your living room? Yes, and I thought of the fireplace myself. But plastic doesn't burn very well. <laughs> 
Yeah, I was thinking of the mantelpiece. Couldn't you uh, put it up there? I tried that, too, but my landlady keeps a canary in a cage on the mantelpiece. Well, isn't there room for them both? Yes, but I don't believe in being cruel to our feathered friends. <laughs> First time I put this thing next to the cage, the canary took one look at it and fell head first into his bird bath. <laughs> don't mind, I'd like to exchange this for some lingerie. Well, if you insist, Miss Brooks, I'll give you this credit slip. Uh, just show it to the clerk in the lingerie department. Oh, before you make it out, there's something else, Mr. Dale. These earrings were purchased here, too. Oh, well, what's wrong with them? They're a trifle too ornate for me. Oh, nonsense. They're beautiful. Just look at the workmanship in those exquisite brass crowbars. <laughs> I'm afraid they're a little too heavy for me, Mr. Dale. Heavy? Well, let me heft them. All right, I'll put one on the counter. Here. <laughs> yes, they are a bit substantial, aren't they? Substantial? They pull my ears down so far, I look like a cocker spaniel. <laughs> I'll just get a nice manicure set instead. Very well, Miss Brooks. Anything else? Not much. I'd like to exchange this pen and pencil set for some stockings and these slippers for a handbag. Miss Brooks, wasn't there anything you received for Christmas that pleased you? Oh, yes, Mr. Dale. I have a blue and white scarf that I'm just delighted with. And who bought that for you? I did. <laughs> now, if you'll give me those other exchange slips, I'll get the rest of my unshopping done. I don't like to rush you, but Walter Denton, a student of mine, has offered to pick me up in his car in a few minutes. Well, I wouldn't bank on it, Miss Brooks. What do you mean? If he's a student of yours, he's probably exchanged his car for a pogo stick. <laughs> it was nice of you to interrupt your holiday to give me this list, Walter. For you, Miss Brooks, my Yuletide spirit knows no bounds. <laughs> what kind of Yuletide did you have, Walter? Oh, magnificent, Miss Brooks. Oh, you should have seen my house. The spirit of giving was rampant. The gifts for everybody all over the place. Sounds wonderful. Yeah. The Horn of Plenty was really loaded this Christmas. <laughs> well, you can't blame your father for relaxing on a holiday. <laughs> What did you get, Walter? Oh, I got some lovely gifts, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Didn't you notice anything different about this car when you got in? Let's see. The four fenders are still missing. <laughs> the hood is still off the motor. The windshield hasn't been replaced yet. Yes, so go on. Something new has definitely been added. The convertible top is still absent. There's only half of a rear view mirror and the glass is out of both doors. I can't figure it out, Walter. What's been added? Nylon seat covers. <laughs> Just what this car needed. <laughs> Who gave them to you? Both my mother and father. Together? Yeah, my father gave me a sweater and my mother gave me a muffler, and I exchanged them. <laughs> Mr. Dale was right. Like teacher, like pupil. What did Harriet Conklin give you? Oh, do you like this plaid sports shirt I've got on? Yes, it's very attractive. Did Harriet get you that? No, but her keychain and 90 cents did. <laughs> well, here we are at your place, Miss Brooks. Safe and... Found? <laughs> and before you get out, Miss Brooks, would you mind telling me what Mr. Boynton got you for Christmas? I know Harriet was egging him on to get you something real personal and feminine. Oh, he almost got me something extremely personal, but I stopped him in time. Oh, what was he going to get? A stapler. <laughs> <laughs> he finally settled for a pair of very clever earrings shaped like crowbars, but just between us, I exchanged them for a manicure set. But Why? What was wrong with the earrings? I couldn't get them on without a stapler. <laughs> well, Connie, did you get all your exchanging done? Yes, Mrs. Davis, I got some wonderful things. Good. I'm glad to see you looking so chipper. You seemed pretty blue last night when Mr. Boynton broke a date with you. He couldn't help it, Mrs. Davis. He had to attend a meeting of the biology club. 
Besides, I enjoyed the movie I saw very much. What did you see, Connie? Born Yesterday with Judy Holliday, Broad Crawford, and Bill Holden. Well, if they were all there, you couldn't have missed Mr. Boynton too much. <laughs> Uh, before I forget, Connie, Mr. Conklin called twice while you were out. Mr. Conklin? What did he want? I'm not sure, Connie, but it's about some kind of a report or something. He wants you to help him with it. But this is my vacation. If he calls again, please tell him I'm out. Oh, I'm afraid you'll have to tell him yourself, dear. I'm going out in the garden. One of our crawling vines has tripped over the garage door. <laughs> I won't be home very long anyway. Maybe he won't. Then again, maybe he will. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Davis. This is Osgood Conklin again. Has Miss Brooks come in yet? Miss Brooks? There is no Miss Brooks here. But this is Main 2496, isn't it? Oui, this is the French and Laundry. Fifi speaking. <laughs> The girl in charge of the mangle. <laughs> Who are you look for, monsieur? I'm looking for a school teacher named Constance Brooks. A school teacher? Oh, la la, have you got the wrong number? <laughs> well, that's a reprieve for a while. Mrs. Davis? Mrs. Davis? Mrs. Davis? Oh, dear, she's out and back. Hello? Hello. This is the One Question for 1,000 program. We're trying to contact Miss Constance Brooks. What? If Miss Constance Brooks can answer one simple question, we have $1,000 in cold, hard cash waiting to be sent to her. $1,000? This is Miss Brooks. Are you absolutely <laughs> certain you are Miss Brooks? Of course. What's the question? The question is, how could you and the French hand laundry have switched phone numbers so quickly? <laughs> Hello? Get away from that mangle, Fifi. Or I'll really take the starch out of your sail. Hello? Isn't this Mr. Conklin? I guess you must have gotten our party line, sir. I... All right, all right, Miss Brooks. We'll forget your little impractical joke. The reason I called is to thank you for your Christmas gift to me. Oh, it was just a little remembrance, Mr. Conklin. You couldn't have chosen a more perfect reminder, Miss Brooks. Two big, heavy bookends. They, they just seem to sense that we haven't had any personal contact since Christmas. And yesterday, as if by magic, one of them toppled off the table and landed on my foot. <laughs> it was like old times. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Conklin, if you'd rather have something else, I, I could... not part with those bookends if they eat up half my salary in Band-Aids. <laughs> See, Miss Brooks, in spite of your raffish and undisciplined displays of wit, I feel that you, like myself, are basically a sentimental person. When I receive a present, I feel it's a token of someone's affection, and I wouldn't dream of exchanging it for anything else. I presume you feel the same way? Hello? <laughs> Certainly, Mr. Conklin. Uh, by the way, Miss Brooks, how did you like my gift to you? Oh, stunning, Mr. Conklin. Well, you know, for the longest time, I couldn't decide whether to buy something ornamental or utilitarian. Then I saw that figure of Atlas. And you gave up both ideas. <laughs> you combined both ideas. Yes, that's about it. Uh, did you find the right spot for it, Miss Brooks? Perfect, Mr. Conklin. I'm keeping it right on the mantelpiece here in our living room. Quiet, Dickie. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I, I'm glad to hear it, Miss Brooks. I'll be able to kill two birds with one stone, then, when you assist me with my report to the Parent Teachers Association. But, Mr. Conklin, this is my vacation. Uh, it's mine, too, Miss Brooks, but this is for the first important meeting of the new year. So I'll be over to your place in about an hour, at which time I can see how effective my atlas looks in your living room. But, Mr. Conklin, you can't come here. The, the house is a mess. Mrs. Davis is in the midst of her spring cleaning. 
Spring cleaning. <laughs> but this is the middle of the winter. I know, but she likes to give herself plenty of time. <laughs> if you don't believe she's doing her spring cleaning, you can ask her yourself, Mr. Conklin. Mrs. Davis! You, Mrs. Davis! Sorry, sir, she must be out in the kitchen dying Easter eggs. <laughs> Save me a pink one. I'll be there in an hour. Oh, no. This is a fine spot to be in. Did you call me, Connie? It's too late now, Mrs. Davis. Too late for what? For me to get down to Sherry's and get Mr. Conklin's present back. He's coming over here in an hour to give me some dictation, and he expects to see it on the mantelpiece. Oh, forgive my absent mind, Connie, but there were so many gadgets here around this Christmas that I just don't remember Mr. Conklin's gift. What was it? A plastic figure of Atlas with a big globe on his head that tells the weather, and a thermometer spine, and also an alarm clock. Oh, where in the world is the alarm clock? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. <laughs> Brush your teeth with Colgate. Colgate Dental Cream, it cleans your breath. Water toothpaste. Colgate toothpaste. Clean your breath. What a toothpaste. What a cleans your teeth. Colgate dental cream cleans your breath while it cleans your teeth. And the Colgate way stops tooth decay best. No other dentifrice, ammoniated or not, offers such conclusive proof. And you should know that Colgate, while not mentioned by name, was the only toothpaste used in the research on tooth decay recently reported in Reader's Digest. So always follow the Colgate way to clean your breath while you clean your teeth. And stop tooth decay best. Brush your teeth with Colgate. Colgate dental cream. It cleans your breath. What a toothpaste. What it cleans your teeth. And the Colgate way, stop tooth decay best. down a bit, I realized that Mr. Conklin had perpetrated his Atlas clock on several other members of the faculty. So the only question was, from whom to borrow one? Then Mrs. Davis reminded me that Mr. Boynton had received one, and there was no more question. I had never seen Mr. Boynton's new apartment, and this seemed like as good a time as any. Be right there. Well, Miss Brooks, this is a surprise. Come on in. Thanks, Mr. Boynton. Here, here, let me take your coat. All right. So this is your new apartment. May I look around? Go right ahead. Aren't you coming with me? Well, you don't have to go anywhere. This is all there is to it. <laughs> Please don't mind the appearance of the place. After all, what can you do with a bachelor? There must be a non censurable answer to that. <laughs> Don't you find this place a bit confining for a big, husky, broad-shouldered, dashing, vital... I forgot what I started to say. <laughs> you, you were wondering if I found this apartment confining. Actually, I don't, Miss Brooks. I don't spend very much time in it, but when I'm here, I, I rather like the compactness of it. Of course, it's different with a girl. I, I don't suppose you'd care for a tight squeeze. Try me. <laughs> certainly wouldn't be any problem to keep clean. I, I'm afraid I don't pay any attention to that end of it. All you'd have to do is wrap yourself in a damp towel, get in the center of the room, and spin around a little. <laughs> well, it may be small, but this place has all the facilities of a larger apartment. Did you know that I have a two-burner electric stove in here? Really? Where? I keep it in my bread box. Oh, <laughs> well, in the kitchen. No, there's no kitchen. I just keep the bread box in the refrigerator. I give up. Where's the refrigerator? In the closet. <laughs> just open that door on your left. All right. I still don't see the refrigerator. Your coat's draped over it. Uh... Well, now that you're here, Miss Brooks, how would you like to stay to lunch? No, thanks, Mr. Boynton. I wouldn't want you to have to unwrap your kitchen just for me. Besides, I've got to be getting back to my place before Mr. Conklin comes to work with me. That's the real reason I dropped over, Mr. Boynton, to borrow the atlas Mr. Conklin gave you. What did you do with the one he gave you? 
I exchanged it for some lingerie. So did I. What color? <laughs> what am I going to do? He expects to see that atlas prominently displayed on my mantelpiece. Well, why don't you phone Mr. Conklin and tell him you went out without your keys and Mrs. Davis has left the house, too? I could do that. Then he'd probably suggest that I come over to his place. That wouldn't be so bad. Well, I don't have my phone in yet, Miss Brooks, but right on the corner there's a gas station or a candy store you can call from. I'll use the gas station. I'm on a little bit of a diet. <laughs> oh, before you go, Miss Brooks, I, I haven't seen you wear the earrings I got you for Christmas as yet. You will put them on for New Year's Eve, won't you? New Year's Eve? Oh, yes. I, I've gotten hold of an extra ticket to the biology club dance. I took it for granted that you'd tag along. Then you can take it for granted that the earrings will drag along with me. <laughs> and while we're on the subject of presents, you don't seem to be wearing the cufflinks I gave you. The cufflinks? Oh, well, well, I'm saving those for New Year's Eve, too. Yes, sir. Well, you better run along now and phone Mr. Conklin. I guess we won't be seeing each other again until our date Sunday night. Oh, we'll see each other before that. When? It all depends on what time we both arrive to exchange our exchanges at the exchange counter. <laughs> so I'll just come on over to your place, Mr. Conklin. Well, if you've lost your keys and Mrs. Davis is out, I suppose it's the only thing you can do, Miss Brooks. But my wife is having some folks in tonight, so we'll have to finish up at your place after dinner. Yes, sir, that'll give me plenty of time. That is, I'll see you soon, Mr. Conklin. Goodbye. 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 Harriet. Oh, Harriet. Here I am, Daddy. What can I do for you? Do you know what's been done with those two monstrosities that Miss Brooks gave me for Christmas? You mean those two cute bookends? Yes, those cute bookends. <laughs> Two green midgets with purple beards shoving their shoulders against yellow wheels. <laughs> Last time I saw them, your mother was cracking walnuts with them. Gosh, Daddy, Mother told me she exchanged them for a vase. What? But Miss Brooks is coming over here to work. She'll expect to see those twin nightmares on my desk. Well, there's only one thing I'll do. I I'll run down to Sherry's and try to get them back before she comes. <laughs> It was just wonderful of you to drive me down here again, Walter. I've got to get back the atlas and Mr. Boynton's earrings at once. Oh, that's okay, Miss Brooks. I've got to get back the keychain Harriet gave me. <laughs> oh, did she ask you about it? Yeah. She said she expected me to wear it on New Year's Eve. Gosh, I wish I'd had my wits about me. I'd have asked her why she wasn't wearing the pearls I gave her. You gave Harriet pearls, Walter? Certainly not. But I know she's exchanged so many gifts it would have thrown a good scare into her. <laughs> well, it's too bad about the keychain, Walter. The shirt you exchanged it for looked lovely on you. Yeah, it did, didn't it? Oh, the thought of exchanging it distresses me deeply. I guess I'm just a sentimentalist at heart, Miss Brooks. A sentimentalist? Yes. When a person near and dear to me gives me a present, I hate to exchange it more than once. <laughs> well, here's the counter. Uh, how do you do, Mr. Dale? Remember me? Now, uh, don't tell me. Let's see. Oh, of course, you were the lovely lady who almost gave me a nervous breakdown this morning. <laughs> and remember me? Certainly. You gave me a nervous breakdown yesterday. <laughs> oh, look, you two aren't going to start all over again, are you? No, Mr. Dale. This time it's going to be very simple. Oh, good. I'd like to turn in some lingerie and get back my atlas. But this morning you were practically livid about this. That was this morning. Then I'd like to turn in my manicure set and get my earrings. Yeah, and I'd like to turn in my sports shirt and get back my keychain. I have a dispatch for you both. <laughs> I'd like to turn in this job and get back my sanity. <laughs> I'll make out your exchange slip in just a moment. But first, Miss Brooks, you've got to do me a small favor. What is it? Just stand behind this counter for one moment while I go out for a smoke. I'm beginning to feel my nerves nibbling at the base of my skull like mice. Oh, but Mr. Day, there I... won't be too many customers at this time of day, but if anyone does come over, just be courteous. By that, I mean be sure to say please when you ask them to drop dead. <laughs> oh, you'll never make a good exchange, clerk. Too sensitive. 
Well, while we're waiting for him, I'm going to look at some sports equipment over in the next aisle. But you can't leave me behind this counter all alone, Walter. Why not? It might open up a whole new career to you. Especially if you don't get Mr. Conklin's atlas back in time. Now, listen, Walter, say... I'll see you later, Miss Brooks. And don't forget to say, please... Oh, dandy. This is turning out to be some vacation. Oh, pardon me, miss, but I'd like to swap this pen knife for... Miss Brooks. You can't have Miss Brooks for that pen knife. <laughs> <laughs> what in the... Mr. Boynton. Oh, I was just going to say blazes. Oh, then go right ahead. What in the blazes are you doing behind this counter? I'm just pinch-hitting for a busy friend. A busy friend? Yes, he's brushing some mice off the base of his skull. <laughs> for you, Mr. Boynton? Well, there, there was something I wanted to exchange for something else, but uh, I, I'll wait until the regular clerk comes back. But he may never come back. The mice may brush him off. <laughs> Why don't you tell me what it is you want to exchange? Well, no, I couldn't, Miss Brooks. It's, it's rather personal. Pardon and... me, young man. Pardon me. Miss, I'd like to swap this vase for Miss Brooks. You can't have Miss Brooks for that day. <laughs> Not even if you threw in a pen knife. But what in the blazes am I doing behind this counter? Exactly. And you, Boynton, what are you doing here? Well, I have something I'd like to exchange, Mr. Conklin. A deplorable practice exchanging gifts shows an abysmal lack of consideration for those who presented them to you. What are you doing here, Mr. Conklin? Uh, me? Uh, I've just been doing some last-minute shopping. I've never been near this exchange counter since Sherry's opened its doors to the public. Oh, me either, but today I... Well, Miss Brooks, I feel a little better now. Thanks for... Well, what do you know? It's a Madison High reunion. (laughs) Oh, then you know these gentlemen, Mr. Dale. Know them. Since Christmas, we've been practically living together. (laughs) I see. This chunky boy with the malignant mustache has been back about nine times. But, Mr. Conklin, I thought you didn't believe in exchanging gifts. I I don't, Miss Brooks. It's just that, well, I was down here with my wife a couple of times. A couple of times. He was here so often, I thought he was trying to turn her in. (laughs) (laughs) That's a hot one. (laughs) Well, I'll be running along now. I've got... One moment, Mr. Boynton. Mr. Dale, has this tall gentleman been down here, too? Has he? He's the most insidious type of all. Insidious? He's the sort who expects the Brooklyn Bridge in return for a pair of cufflinks. <laughs> oh, Mr. Boynton, you did exchange the cufflinks I gave you. Well, what are you complaining about? You turned in the atlas he gave you, didn't you? That was the atlas I gave you, Miss Brooks. <laughs> How could you do it? I hate to see a canary bird with a limp. <laughs> Anyway, you're a fine one to talk, mustache. You turned in the desk lamp she gave you. Desk lamp? Well, that's what I gave you, Mr. Conklin. Well, what about those earrings that pulled down your ears, Miss Brooks? <laughs> and more important than any of this, what about getting out that report of mine to the Parent Teachers Association? You're right, Mr. Conklin. I'll settle this matter of gifts once and for all, Mr. Dale. I'm going to turn in everything I've received this Christmas for just two presents for these gentlemen. Two presents? Yes. Give Mr. Boynton a Cocker Spaniel and Mr. Conklin a workhorse. (laughs) And now, once again, here is Eve Arden. Freedom is everybody's job. That's why all of us must work to keep our individual rights and freedoms by voting in an informed way, serving willingly on juries and public committees, and taking an interest in the development of our community, state, and country. That way, we can all make 1951 a year that will prove the strength and success of democracy. And now, on behalf of my sponsor, the Colgate Palmolive Peat Company, and myself, a very happy New Year to all of you. Good night. Reminding you to tune in next week to another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair and Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written by Al Lewis and Arthur Allsberg, with the music of Wilbur Hatch. 
Mr. Boynton is played by Jeff Chandler. Mr. Conklin by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, and Joseph Kearns. If you like mysteries that are as full of chuckles as chills, be sure to hear Mr. and Mrs. North every Tuesday over this same network. Don't miss the exciting and laughable adventures of these amateur detectives. Hear Mr. and Mrs. North every Tuesday night. And be with us again next week at this same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. Stay tuned now for Jack Benny. This is CBS for Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. Well, with the Christmas holidays so close at hand, our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, is faced with a few problems common to many of us. First, she still has all her Christmas shopping to do, and second, she has very little time to do it in. And third, she has no money to do it with. <laughs> at least I have very little money. Twenty dollars, to be exact. And considering the people I usually give presents to, I knew that wouldn't go very far. After thinking it over for a while, however... I arrived at the only possible solution to my dilemma, which I conveyed to my landlady at breakfast last Wednesday morning. Then you're going to spend the entire $20 on a gift for Mr. Boynton, Connie? Yes, it's the only thing I can do, Mrs. Davis. I think I should be able to get him a nice gift for $20. It's better than giving a number of my friends a lot of trash. Don't you agree? I, uh, I suppose so, dear. I know I certainly didn't expect anything from you. <laughs> well, I'm glad. Because... After all, what difference does it make that I cook your meals all year round? That I make up your room every day? <laughs> that I never badger you for the rent when you get six weeks behind? Or that I'm constantly helping you with your problems as if you were my own daughter? I do it out of the goodness of my heart. And I certainly don't expect anything in return. If I crawled under the rug, I wouldn't even make a bump. <laughs> but, Mrs. Davis, we agreed we wouldn't exchange presents this year. Of course we did, Connie. So you stick to our agreement. After all, what difference does it make if I happen to forget and ordered you a beautiful gift? You ordered me a gift? Oh, dear, it slipped out. <laughs> well, slip it back in. Uh, perhaps it wasn't as much of a sacrifice for you as... The... What difference does it make that I far exceeded my budget to get it for you? So I'll just eat a little less for the next six months. <laughs> just because the spirit of the season has swept me away doesn't mean it has to sweep you, too. Sweep me. It might easily clean me out. <laughs> well, I suppose I actually should give you a gift, too, since we're so close. Now, dear, you'll do no such thing. Don't give it another thought. Well, all right. But... <laughs> I'll be going on perfectly well, squeezing oranges by hand for another year. <laughs> Just because I can hardly straighten out my poor fingers when I'm through with no concern of yours. Then you want a finger straightener. Um... <laughs> An orange juice squeezer. Why, Connie, how did you know? <laughs> it was just a wild guess. <laughs> but the ten dollars they wanted, Sherry's, is much more than I'll let you spend. Well, then I won't. So if you'll just give me seven dollars cash, I'll get the squeezer at McGinty's sales company. I happen to have an exclusive introductory credit card there. It's the only thing that lets you in, and it entitles you to a third off on everything. As I say, I should be able to get Mr. Boynton a nice gift for $13. <laughs> I'll give you the money as soon as I get my bag. Thanks, dear. Now I'll tell you what I got for you. It's something I felt was very personal. Something personal? What is it? A chess set. A chess set? Yes. <laughs> I know how Mr. Boynton loves the game, and it'll give you two something to do together on those long winter evenings. <laughs> that is, if you know how the game goes. <laughs> Certainly, right out the window. <laughs> uh, it was very thoughtful of you, Mrs. Davis. Oh, there's Walter to drive me to school. Be right out, Walter. I'd better be going, Mrs. Davis. All right, dear. 
Well, I intend to do the rest of my shopping this morning, so I'll drop off your present at school. Maybe you and Mr. Boynton can use it in the cafeteria at lunch. We might at that. Those chessmen ought to taste a lot more tender than the rest of the food. <laughs> Walter, is it my imagination, or are you driving more carefully today? I was hoping you'd notice, dear teacher. Yeah, I'm driving particularly carefully today. You see, as part of her Christmas present, my mother gave me new bumpers for this car. <laughs> what happened? Pedestrians finally wear out your old ones? <laughs> well, that was a thoughtful gift, but isn't it a little early to be receiving Christmas presents? Oh, no, ma'am. No, indeed. Now, I must have received three-quarters of my gifts already, Particularly for my close friends at school. Oh, yeah, they've already given me their gifts. Three quarters of them. Maybe even seven eighths. As a matter of fact, I can only think of one or two who haven't. As a matter of fact, I think I'll get out and walk. <laughs> oh, nothing like the spirit of giving at Christmas, is there? You know, of course, a kid like me who operates on a limited budget can only exchange gifts with his nearest relatives and his closest and most intimate friends. Isn't that so, Miss Brooks? It certainly is, stranger. <laughs> that is, in essence, I agree with you, Walter. But the truth of the matter is, I only have $13 for my Christmas shopping. That leaves me with just enough money for a gift for Mr. Boynton. Now, do you understand? Mm, I guess I do. Well, I certainly didn't expect anything from you, Miss Brooks. I'm glad. So because... after all, what difference does it make that I pick you up and drive you to school every day all year long? <laughs> or that I spend half of my time at school running errands for you? <laughs> you do whatever you want to, Miss Brooks. But no one else is going to receive the beautiful present that I selected for you. You bought me a present? Already? Now, please forget about it, will you? All right, then. Yeah, after all... I'm getting enough gifts without that $7 briefcase of cherries that I've wanted more than anything else in the world. Walter, I'd like to buy the briefcase for you, but $7 is rather high. Oh, much too high, Miss Brooks. So I wouldn't let you spend that much money for anything. Good. So if you give me $5 in cash, I'll get the same thing at McGinney's. <laughs> As I say, $8 ought to buy a fine gift for Mr. Boynton. Yeah, I have an exclusive introductory credit card at McGinney's. Everything at a third off. It's the only card that'll let you in. At the moment, that isn't what worries me. No? Well, what does then, Miss Brooks? Does McGinney print a card that will let me out? <laughs> Walter, there's no reason to sneak past Mr. Conklin's office, even if we are five minutes late. But, Miss Brooks, you know how Mr. Conklin feels about such things. What would you say if he suddenly did step out of his office now? Good morning, Miss Brooks. <laughs> that answer your question, Walter? <laughs> Mr. Conklin, I realize we're a little late, sir, but if you'll only... Tut, 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 my dear, don't give it a second thought. I'm delighted to give my students and faculty a little latitude this time of year. It's the Christmas season, and I'm filled with the spirit of peace on earth and goodwill to all men. <laughs> well, it's nice of you to extend it to females and young boys. Not at all, Miss Brooks. Now, will you come into my office, please? I have something to ask you. But, sir, I'm five minutes late and now. You'll be five I... minutes later. Into my office. Yes, sir. See you later, Walter. Yeah, bye, Miss Brooks. Now, sit down, my dear. Sit right down, and I'll get directly to the point. I want some advice from you, Miss Brooks. Some advice? Yes, about a gift. I'm uh, doing my Christmas shopping this afternoon. I want you to be sure to tell me what you want before I leave. But, sir, I didn't think you approved of faculty members exchanging gifts. Oh, I don't, Miss Brooks. It's just that I happen to be imbued with the spirit of giving, the spirit of Christmas. And if I choose to remember my teachers, I certainly don't expect any loot or gifts in return. <laughs> Good. Of course, if my teachers insist on showing their appreciation for the many little favors I've done for them in the past, I'm powerless to stop them. <laughs> I'm hooked. Uh, I was wondering what I could get you for Christmas, sir. Could you give me a suggestion? Something you particularly needed or wanted for about 50 cents. 
My dear, I want you to forget we've even mentioned the word gifts this morning. Dismiss it from your mind. Besides, I smoke too much anyway. <laughs> smoke. Yes, and ten dollars is too much for anyone to pay for the alligator tobacco pouch I've always wanted. <laughs> well, sir, I'd certainly like to get it for you, but that is rather expensive. Ten dollars is far, far too expensive. I wouldn't dream of letting you spend that much money. Well, I'm glad because so I... So if you have the money with you, <laughs> you know just where I can get it for seven. Murdered again by McGinty's. <laughs> Ah, here we are, Miss Brooks. My dessert and coffee. And I brought you a piece of pineapple pie a la mode. Why, Mr. Boynton, what a thoughtful Christmas present. Christmas present? Well, it's exactly what I've always wanted. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have gone to all that extra expense. What extra expense? The pineapple pie would have been enough. You should have kept the a la mode for my birthday. <laughs> pineapple pie a la mode. As I always say, Mr. Boynton, let the other women get their mink coats and pearl necklaces. Just give me a gift that touches you right in the stomach, uh, heart. <laughs> oh, I get it now. <laughs> You're joking. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid you'd see it that way. <laughs> but, Mr. Boynton, this actually would be enough. After all, it's the spirit of giving that counts rather than the gift itself. Not entirely, Miss Brooks. True, the spirit must be there, but the gift is important, too. I've ordered you a beautiful gift. I know how you are about giving gifts of equal value, and I wouldn't want to disappoint you. You picked a fine time to start. That is, it's very thoughtful of you, Mr. Boynton. Very thoughtful. Particularly since I joined the Christmas Club a year ago and put away a dollar a week just for your gift. Fifty-two dollars? For my present? Fifty-two seventy-five. They pay interest. But just because we've given each other gifts of equal value in the past, I don't want that to influence you this Christmas. Fifty-two dollars. Uh-huh. And that, combined with the thirty dollars I borrowed from Mrs. Davis, ought to buy you a very nice gift. Miss Brooks, I've just been thinking. I hope you've been thinking what I think you've been thinking. <laughs> yes, Mr. Boynton? Well, after all, it really is the spirit of giving that counts rather than the gift itself. You've convinced me. Here, this package is for you and Merry Christmas. For me? You got this for me? <laughs> Must I wait for Christmas, or may I open it now? What's inside, Miss Brooks? Yes, yes, no, yes, chess. A chess set. What a wonderful <laughs> present. Well, I was going to get you a few more gifts, but since you convinced me... Hi, Miss Brooks. Hi, Mr. Boynton. Oh, hello, Harriet. Mr. Boynton, Daddy wants to see you in his office right away. Something about signing a requisition for some test tubes you wanted. Oh, thank you, Harriet. And, Miss Brooks, your landlady called, and she wants you to call back when you can. Now, let's see. Is there someone I've forgotten? Better look under the table to make sure. Did Mrs. Davis say what she wanted me to call her about? No, but she said she'd keep a receiver off the hook so a line would be open when you call. <laughs> There's something wrong with that, but offhand, I don't know just what. <laughs> well, I'd better get up to Mr. Conklin's office and get that requisition signed. Thanks again for the gift, Miss Brooks. It really was quite unexpected. Yes, for both of us. I mean, uh, both of us may use it. Of course. Well, see you later, Miss Brooks. I'll walk to the phone with you, Miss Brooks. All right, Harriet. Well, how has Santa been treating you so far, dear? Oh, not too badly. Walter gave me a slave bracelet, but I don't think I'll wear it. Why not? You should see what he had engraved on it. Finder, please return this girl to Walter Denton. <laughs> <laughs> Why, I think that's cute, Harriet. If a certain party gave me one of those bracelets, I think I might enjoy getting lost. <laughs> now, excuse me, dear, while I make this call. Okay. Bye, Miss Brooks. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Davis. Connie. Oh, Connie. Well, how did you like the gift I gave you? Oh, it's lovely, Mrs. Davis. Simply lovely. I knew you'd be enthusiastic over that black silk negligee. Well, <laughs> certainly. It's something Mr. Boynton and I can... Black silk negligee? <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> I intended it was a chess set, Connie, just to throw you off the track. And you did, right into the path of a screaming locomotive. <laughs> 
Was the negligee the wrong size, dear? Oh, I'm not sure, but I think Mr. Boynton takes the 38. <laughs> Speak louder, Connie. It sounded almost as though you said Mr. Boynton. I've got to hang up now, Mrs. Davis. I just gave somebody a gift, and I've got to get it back before he opens it. Why? Do you think he won't like it, Connie? Oh, not exactly, Mrs. Davis. It's something that all men like, but on somebody else. <laughs> Come in. Ah, oh, come in, Boynton. Come in. Sit right down, my boy. Oh, thank you, Mr. Conklin. I came in to sign that requisition for those test tubes. I know it needs both our signatures. Ah, yes, yes. Here, use this fountain pen, Boynton. A Christmas gift from Miss Enright, a fabulously generous person. And not that I expect gifts from my faculty, mind you. By last year, there were three teachers who gave me nothing for Christmas. And one of them is still with us. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Merry Christmas, Boynton. And a Merry Christmas, <laughs> Merry Christmas to you, sir. Is that all, Boynton? <laughs> no, sir, and a Happy New Year. <laughs> I had a feeling you'd say that. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, if you'll pardon my curiosity, just what is that gaily wrapped parcel you're carrying under your arm? <laughs> oh, it's nothing, sir. Just a little present I Oh, got. thank you so much. <laughs> Sir, so you were teasing your old principal, eh, Boynton? <laughs> no, sir, it's only... Never it. mind what it is, Boynton. It's not what a gift is that counts, but the spirit in which it is given. What is it, Boynton? Uh, it's a chess set, sir. Splendid. Just what I need. I know just where I can exchange it forever. It's exactly what I want. <laughs> Now, go right ahead, Boynton, sign that requisition, and we'll put it in the works at once. All right, and uh, thank you, sir. Forget it, Boynton. Just consider those test tubes as my Christmas present to you. Mr. Boynton? Oh, Mr. Boynton, I'm glad I finally found you. I missed you right after lunch. Goodness, Miss Brooks, you're yes. breathless. Please, this is no time for flattery. <laughs> oh, you mean I'm winded. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've been looking for you after every period since noon. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to return that gift I gave you. There's been a slight mistake, and I have to exchange it. Uh, the gift you gave me? Well, uh, you, you can't exchange it, Miss Brooks. Uh, I used it during my free period. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't it a little skimpy around the hips? <laughs> You opened it already? Well, I, I haven't exactly opened it, but... Well, I, I like chess. It's my favorite game. Believe me, Mr. Boynton, in this thing, you couldn't make a move. <laughs> Look, I really must have it back. You see, I gave you the wrong present by mistake. Oh, well, then I may as well tell you the truth. I gave it to Mr. Conklin as a Christmas present. I hadn't intended to, but before I knew it, he seemed to take possession of it. <laughs> You gave him the gift I gave you? Mr. Boynton, I'm shocked. How could you bring yourself to give away a gift someone else had given you? If you knew the time and thought and effort I put in to select a gift that would suit your personality. <laughs> what am I saying? Really, Miss Brooks, it all happened so quickly. I had no alternative, but... Please, Mr. Uh, Boynton, no excuses. I still think you were quite negligee. A negligee. <laughs> Well, I've got to get it back at once, so here goes. Well, good luck, Miss Brooks. Come in. Why, Miss Brooks, come in, my dear. Well, have you decided what little gift you would like from your principal this year? Well, frankly, I'm undecided, sir, between a little diamond wristwatch and a little alligator handbag. How about a little psychoanalysis? <laughs> Remember, this is Osgood Conklin you're talking to, Miss Brooks, not Daddy Warbuck. Well, fortunately, Mr. Conklin, I managed to obtain one of those exclusive personal discount cards from the McGinty Sales Company. A little boy was handing them out in the street. And if you gave me the cash, I think I could get a certain watch for well under $50. Fifty dollars? <laughs> Miss Brooks, I am just as susceptible to the infectious generosity of the season as the next man. But I do not intend to allow that infection to kill off my entire life saving. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Conklin, next to the watch and the handbag, the only thing I want is a chess set. A so chess I don't... set. Here, Miss Brooks, exactly what I got for you. Take it. It's yours. Merry Christmas. 
My, what a delightful surprise. <laughs> I'm glad you like it, Miss Brooks. You just can't imagine the time and the thought I put into the selection of your gift. <laughs> Truly, my dear, it was quite a struggle to get it. Well, I'm glad he didn't give it up without a fight. <laughs> You certainly have a lovely collection of presents in here, Mr. Conklin. There's still one teacher I haven't heard from yet. Mr. Perkins in the math department. Come in and bring it with you. <laughs> Why, Mr. Stone. Hello, Conklin. Miss Brooks, season's greetings to you both. And the same to you, sir. Ah, here, Conklin. I uh, brought over this gift for you. Uh, uh, Oh, oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Stone. Oh, forget I'm the head of the board today, Conklin. Get into that old Christmas spirit. Enjoy yourself. Relax. Smile. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Have you uh, given out all of your gifts uh, yet, Osgood? <laughs> yep. Gifts? Oh, oh, yes. Miss Brooks just finished wrapping yours, Mr. Stone, here. Oh, but, sir, that package... Yes, is... Miss Brooks, you were saying... <laughs> use out of your gift, Mrs. Stone. And for longer life, rinse it out every night and hang it up in the bathroom. Oh? Uh, is it a shirt, Conklin? Oh, no, sir. Handkerchief? No. Socks? No, but I'll give you a hint. Two people can use it at the same time. <laughs> if they're midgets. <laughs> Two can use it at the same time, eh? Oh, is it something that can be used outdoors on an athletic field? <laughs> Possibly, but it might be a little chilly for night games. <laughs> Mr. Stone, why don't you open it and see for yourself? Oh, you don't have to ask me twice, Conklin. <laughs> I'm just as curious as a little child at Christmas. <laughs> hey, hey. Oh. <laughs> Conklin. I, I don't understand. Well, what could be nicer than a black silk negligee? <laughs> it's the perfect gift for you, sir. And I know you'll get many years of pleasure in using... What could be nicer than a black silk negligee? <laughs> Mr. Stone. Uh, Mr. Stone, believe me, Uncle. I have heard of asinine practical jokes before. But pulling a trick like this on Christmas is an absolute insult. <laughs> Mr. Stone, I can explain. It was a simple natural error. You see, when I got this from Mr. Boynton... <laughs> Miss Brooks, why did Mr. Boynton give me a black silk negligee? I can't understand either, sir. Pale blue is much more your color. I, I can't understand at all. Conklin, I'm still waiting for an explanation. Come in. Uh, Mrs. Davis wanted to see Miss Brooks on an urgent matter, sir. That's right, Osgood. Oh, hello, Mrs. Stone. Hello, Mrs. Davis. Oh, Connie, there's the negligee I gave you. I see you've opened it. What? Uh, Miss Brooks, you mean you gave me a gift that someone else had given you for Christmas? Well, you see... Boynton, do you mean you gave me a gift that someone else had given you? <laughs> well, sir, I... Conklin, do you mean you gave me a gift that three other people had given you? <laughs> well, I... I, I that just... nightgown has more mileage on it than the 1928 Ford. <laughs> Uncle? I don't quite understand what's going on around here, but if your idea of a joke is to hand me a cheap nightgown... <laughs> that is not a cheap nightgown. It costs $22.50. $22.50? Hmm. Say, it is rather pretty thin. <laughs> Colton, perhaps I've been a little hasty. I think Mrs. Stone will be delighted with your thoughtful gift. Oh, well, I'm afraid I did give you the wrong gift, Mr. Stone. I had really intended that for Mrs. Conklin. But, Mr. Conklin, I was going to give it to my mother. If you were, she'll have to come down and take it off my back. <laughs> <laughs> that gift was originally given to me by Mrs. Davis. That's true, Connie. But I'm afraid I'll have to take it back, dear. Take it back? But why, Mrs. Davis? My sister Angela gave it to me as a gift, and she's coming over tonight to see it on me. <laughs> so if you don't mind, I'll take it home. Well, see you all again soon. <laughs> well, there goes Mother's negligee. Whose negligee, Boynton? 
I might ask you the same question, Conklin. Uh, really, Mr. Stone, I... Gentlemen, Mr. please, we shouldn't argue. Let's try to remember it always as our negligee. <laughs> been a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. and only permanent with homogenized waving cream and deep magic new facial cleansing lotion that cleans your skin deep deep down where beauty begins present our miss brooks starring eve arden it's time once again for another comedy episode of our miss brooks transcribed but first the people who make new creamy prom hope that this has been a very merry christmas for you and your family and you know, right now would be a good time to start planning your new hairdo for 1956. But remember this. The 1956 home permanent is new creamy prom. The first and only permanent with homogenized waving cream. New creamy prom actually waves new softness and manageability right into your hair. Gives you a complete hair beauty treatment as you wave. Only new creamy prom has homogenized waving cream. It's completely new, completely different from ordinary drippy waving solutions that often leave your hair dry, frizzy, hard to manage. New Creamy Prom is rich with costly conditioning ingredients. It even pours like thick cream. That's why new Creamy Prom actually waves new softness and manageability right into your hair. Leaves hair in better condition than any other permanent. And talk about easy. Smooth it on, roll it up. You've got yourself a prom. No dripping, no rinsing, no timing, no messy neutralizer. Smooth it on, roll it up, you've got yourself a prom. So wave new softness and manageability right into your hair. Get new creamy prom with homogenized waving cream. And even if you're in between permanents, don't wait. Get new creamy prom end curl permanent right now. New creamy, creamy prom. Well, many of us will spend Christmas Eve with our families and friends. But since her family is too far away to visit and her friends have other plans, I'm afraid our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, won't be quite so fortunate. In fact, I can see her now trimming a tiny little tree in the living room of the modest cottage she shares with Mrs. Davis. That's quite a nice tree, Connie. It isn't really, Mrs. Davis, but it's all I could afford. What did you pay for it? I found it in the vacant lot. <laughs> what I like about it is the size. It's not too big or too small. It's just too small. <laughs> I can hardly believe it's Christmas again. Connie, I'd love to stay here and celebrate Christmas Eve with you, but I promised my sister Angela I'd come over to her place. I'd ask you to join me, but... Angela hasn't been too well lately. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Mrs. Davis. I'll just spend a quiet evening at home here. But how about Mr. Boynton? 
Don't tell me he was too shy to ask you for a date on Christmas Eve. Why do you think there's mistletoe on all four walls? <laughs> well, Mr. Boynton asked me all right, but then he canceled yesterday. Said he's going upstate to visit his folks for a couple of days. But don't worry about me, Mrs. Davis. I'll have a gay time. I'll listen to the radio and read. And from this window, I can see our neighbor's television antenna. <laughs> but what about the little gifts you've got for Walter Denton and Mr. and Mrs. Conklin and Harriet? When are you going to deliver them? Oh, they told me not to bother. They said we'd exchange on the 26th. What's that, Mrs. Davis? It's Minerva. Where are you, dear? Oh, she's over by the tree. Here, Rover. Uh, Minerva. <laughs> Isn't it the strangest thing how she bites at the pine needles? Well, I've got to run along now, dear. Stop drinking those pine needles, Minerva. Come on over here. That's a good kitty. Now, I'll just settle down in Mrs. Davis's rocker and we'll have ourselves a nice, quiet rock. I've got to exercise more. My bones are resting. <laughs> oh, it's the rocker. <laughs> kind of soothing at that. You seem contented enough, Minerva. It was the night before Christmas and all through the house. Not a creature was stirring. Not even a mouse. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to upset you. Oh, gosh, I think it. Oh, now, who can that be? Expecting anyone, Minerva? That's funny. Nobody's here. Well, I'm here. Where? Oh, leaning on my knee. <laughs> what can I do for you? Well, I'm a salesman, but I don't believe in giving any sales talk or sob stories. All I do is tell you what I'm selling. And if you want to buy okay, it's not okay. Okay. What are you selling? Well, it's Christmas Eve, and I'm just a small urchin, a little on the underprivileged side. And I'm trying to make a few dollars to get some wood to heat our tiny apartment. So the while she's singing to my three sick sisters, my mother's lips don't turn blue. <laughs> That's what I like. No sob stories. <laughs> if you're selling handkerchiefs, I'll take six. Well, no, ma'am. I'm selling Christmas trees. Well, they're only a dollar apiece. But I've already got a tree. Well, then I'll make it 50 cents. I really don't need How it. How about a quarter? Look, little boy. Oh, this can be arranged. Please take them. <laughs> These aren't ordinary trees, you know. They're magic. Magic? Yes, ma'am. You'd be surprised what miracles are happen to you if you buy one. Well, a quarter isn't too much to pay for a miracle. Well, it's 50 cents. I thought you said 25. <laughs> well, that's when you sounded tougher to sell. Oh. Well, before I melt down to my coal buttons and the stovepipe hat, here's 50 cents. Well, you won't be sorry, ma'am. Well, here's a little tree. Say, it is kind of cute at that. Would you like to come in and help me set it up? Well, I can. I've got to get right home. My sitter's been alone long enough. <laughs> your sitter? What about your mother and the firewood? Oh, that's just a routine. Well, my folks are attending a dinner the other bank presidents are giving for father. <laughs> well, good night, lady, and Merry Christmas. The same to you, you little underprivileged millionaire. <laughs> well, I'll put this tree over here. Maybe we can find some extra trimming for it in the morning. Minerva, will you stop gnawing on those pine needles? I wish I knew what made them so appetizing to her. <laughs> oh, fine. Now, you come over here and let those things alone. Now, get on my lap. There we are. Well, I guess I'm not the only one that's spending Christmas Eve alone without family or friends. But who can tell? Maybe Santa Claus has something up his big red sleeve that I don't even know about yet. Of course, I do have a squeaky rocker and Minerva. Jingle bells, jingle bells, and merry stuff like that. 
Oh, what fun it is to rock with a big fat drunken cat. <laughs> Something wonderful could happen to Miss Brooks this Christmas. It's happened before. I mean the day she first tried Deep Magic, the wonderful new facial cleansing lotion that cleans your skin up to three times cleaner than soaps or creams and protects your skin against cold winter weather's damage. Deep Magic is completely different. It's a lanolin gentle flowing lotion cleanser that flows deeper into your pores and gently removes deep pore dirt and makeup other cleansers can't reach. Deep Magic cleans deep, deep down where beauty begins and leaves behind an invisible protection like nature's own. That's why Deep Magic keeps your skin soft and smooth, even in the coldest weather. So remember, for gentle, deep cleansing and gentle protection, try Deep Magic Facial Cleansing Lotion. No other cleansing method leaves your skin so clean and clear, so soft and radiant. Deep Magic the cleansing lotion that cleans your skin Deep, deep down where beauty begins As I sat in the living room Christmas Eve with Minerva the cat on my lap, I couldn't help noticing that the tree which I'd bought from that wealthy urchin had a rather peculiar luminosity. Although there wasn't any artificial illumination, it seemed to glow from deep down in its branches. As I rocked back and forth, I started to get very drowsy. Oh, the little boy said this tree was magic, but I don't... No, I don't believe it either. Still, it is Christmas Eve. Such a very strange things have happened on Christmas Eve. Huh? Oh. Hmm? What, what, what's that? Oh, I must have been dozing. Coming! Well, it's Walter Denton. Come in, Walter. Noel, Noel, joyeux Noel. Gracias. Come on into the living room, Walter. Thanks, Miss Brooks. Here, I brought you this little gift to put under your tree. Oh, that was very thoughtful of you. Put it under this tree over here. Okay. Say, you've got uh, two trees, haven't you? Yes, one for Minerva and one for me. <laughs> what's that? Don't pay any attention to her. She's pine needle happy. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Walter, while you're here, you might as well pick up the little gift I got for you. Oh, but you shouldn't have, Miss Brooks. Where is it? <laughs> it's under the tree on your right. It isn't much, just a remembrance. It, oh, gee, I, I almost forgot. I, I can't open it yet. Why not? Oh, you mean you want to put it under your tree at home and open it with your family. No, not exactly, but I'll get it later, Miss Brooks. Oh, there they are now. I'll answer it. <laughs> there who are now? Yeah, come on in, folks. Come on in. She was all alone when I got here. Oh, it's really a surprise, isn't it? You should have stayed home Christmas Eve. Besides, <laughs> it's freezing out. Oh, now, Osgood, don't be so grouchy. Hello, Miss Brooks, and Merry Christmas. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Conklin, and Harriet, how are you all? <laughs> I'm cold. <laughs> Say, Harriet. Yes, Walter? There's a lot of mistletoe around this room. I know. It's real pretty. Um, Osgood, you notice all the mistletoe in this room? What? <laughs> oh, that green stuff. <laughs> More often than not, it makes me sneeze. Oh, come on, Osgood. Oh, now, Martha, don't embarrass me. I don't... It I... doesn't make you sneeze, does it, Harriet? I'm willing to find out. <laughs> May I, Mr. and Mrs. Conklin? Well, if it's all right with Harriet, it's all right with us. Oh, come on, Walter, we're getting old. <laughs> oh, gosh, you're sweet, Harriet. Oh, isn't that cute, Osgood? 
Now, come here, dear. How about one for your faithful old wife? Well, <laughs> it is customary, I guess. So there, I'm under the stuff. Now, pucker up, dear. Very well. Uh, uh, yeah, you see, I told, I told you. I, 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 ah! <laughs> oh, now let's stop this romantic dribble and act like adult human beings. Uh, Miss Brooks, I'd like to take advantage of this visit to inquire as to your plans for the coming year's classwork. Now, please, uh, Osgood, this is no time to talk of school affairs. We're here to spend part of our holiday with Miss Brooks. It was very nice of you to think about me, Mrs. Conklin. It was nice of all of you. I really have... Where are Walter and Harriet? Denton, get my daughter away from that mistletoe at once. <laughs> Mr. Conklin, Harriet isn't allergic to mistletoe. No, but I'm allergic to you. <laughs> oh, Harriet's almost irresistible sometimes, especially alongside of older women like Mrs. Conklin and Miss Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the bell. I'll get it. Why, Mr. Boynton, come in. Oh, thanks, Miss Brooks. I thought you were going upstate to see your folks. Well, I was, but they sent me a wire that they wanted to come down here for a week or so. Now, they'll arrive in the morning. So I thought I'd drop this little gift off for you tonight. Oh, but you shouldn't have. Where is it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just put it under the tree in the living room. Look who's here, everybody. Well, it's Mr. Boynton. Hi there, Mr. B. Oh, this is nice. Hello, Boynton. <laughs> Pretty cold out, isn't it? <laughs> Hello, folks. This is beginning to get more like Christmas Eve every minute. Sit down, Mr. Boynton. Oh, I'm certainly glad your folks decided to visit you instead of vice versa. Uh, <clears throat> Miss Brooks, have you pointed out the mistletoe to Mr. Boynton? Oh, why don't you stop that nonsense, Martha? <laughs> it isn't nonsense. Uh, Mr. Boynton, uh, look at the mistletoe. Mistletoe? Oh, yes. You know, a very interesting example of the flora found in various areas throughout the globe. <laughs> An evergreen parasitic shrub, it is indigenous to the regions where apple trees and oaks abound. Now that the lecture is over, may we ask questions? Well, certainly, Miss Brooks. Want to stand under it? Stand under it? Well, you see, because of a, certain characteristics in its makeup, an allergy is sometimes aggravated by its presence. I'll take a chance if you will. <laughs> come on, Mr. Boynton. Oh, come on, Mr. Boynton. Uh, just bring him over to this wall here. Oh, I'll get under it if you like. Well, don't just stand there. Can't you see Miss Brooks is cooking? Oh. <laughs> don't fuss for me. I couldn't eat a thing. <laughs> Boynton, don't you know what standing under the mistletoe signifies? Well, I know what it signifies to most people. Uh, but, but to me, it's... It, 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 it. Well, there goes 85 cents worth of mistletoe. <laughs> Honest Brooks will return in a moment. It can't be a Merry Christmas or a Happy New Year either if you mar it with accidents. So leave the dreaming to our Miss Brooks and keep your head nailed on tight during this hectic holiday season. CBS Radio wishes you the merriest of yules and a happy, healthy 1956. But you've got to make it all come true yourself. Driving, drive carefully. Holiday accidents are the most tragic of all. The most numerous, too, by the way. Walking, walk with care. Cross only at intersections and with the light. Jaywalkers are really inviting trouble during the holiday season because drivers are more apt to be preoccupied with their own problems these days, less apt to avoid colliding with them if they're in the way. We don't want to sound a somber note in this holiday season, but maybe this reminder will help our listeners survive 55. Remember, during this season of traditional visiting out, safety first, second and always, at home, out on foot, out driving in all your holiday season pursuits. Well, 
Well, my anticipation of a lonely Christmas Eve at home was delightfully dispelled by the arrival of my friends. On Christmas Eve, I was even willing to include Mr. Conklin in this group. Hey, I know what let's do. Let's open up the presents right now. Well, wow. splendid suggestion, Walter. Uh, shouldn't we wait until just before we leave? Might be less embarrassing that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to open them now, go right Golly, away. Golly, this one tree is pretty crowded. I'll put some of these packages under this little one over here. <laughs> I got the funniest feeling when I touched that branch. What kind of a feeling, Walter? Well, I would... Say, you're Harriet Conklin, aren't you? Why, sure, I'm Harriet Conklin. Walter, what's the matter with you? Nothing. Nothing's the matter with me. It's just that I want to tell you something. Harriet, you've got to change. You want to try to be more like Miss Brooks. What do you mean, Walter? Well, if you want me to stay interested in you... You've got to be more alluring, youthful, glamorous, feminine, in that real feline Brooks way. Walter, have you been drinking pine needles, too? <laughs> Why, look at the tree. It seems to be glowing. Oh, what do you mean, glowing? It's just a reflection from the street light. This party's giving me the meaning. <laughs> Holidays, indeed. Here, I'll just move the tree where it won't glisten in our eyes. There we go. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Merry Christmas! Why, Mr. Conklin? Of course I'm Mr. Conklin. Happy go lucky, fun loving. Gag a minute, Osgood. <laughs> Gag a minute, Osgood. Sometimes I've wanted to. <laughs> Miss Brooks, is that really you standing there? I think so, Mr. Conklin. Why do you ask? Because you suddenly look so different, so intelligent. <laughs> Miss Brooks, I've made up my mind. You are now head of the Madison High English Department. Ha, ha, ha. Well, thank you, fun-loving Osgood. Ah, yes, I'm going to put this wonderful tree where it belongs, right in the center of the room. Give me a hand, Boynton. Yes, sir, Mr. Conklin. I'll just take this end here. <laughs> Miss Brooks. Yes, Mr. Boynton? Come here, baby. <laughs> I said, come here, Connie. You did not. You said, come here, baby, and I'm here. Hey, look, he's taking her over to the mistletoe. Isn't it wonderful? What are you going to do, Mr. Barton? Call me Phil, Connie. And this is what I'm going to do. Oh. Well, Connie, oh. how does that make you feel? Oh, I feel like I'm in a dream, Philip. A wonderful, beautiful dream. Oh, what's that? Mr. Boynton. Mr. Boynton, where did you go? Who is everybody? Oh, I must have been dreaming. Well, that's real enough. I'll be right there. Oh, I'm sorry, Minerva. I didn't mean to drop you. Surprise! Merry Christmas, Mr. Brock. I'm cold. <laughs> Why, it's the Conklins and Walter and Mr. Boynton. But you all just left. I mean, come in. We thought it would be nice if we'd spend our Christmas Eve together, Miss Brooks. Yes, and we've brought a few little gifts over for you. I'll just put them under this tree here. Yes, do that, Walter. Well, aren't you going to ask me why I didn't go upstate, Miss Brooks? I know why, Mr. Barton. Your folks are coming down to see you. How did you know that? I just got the telegram. Uh, don't let's get too carried away with the holidays. You've got to prepare for a hard school season ahead, Miss Brooks. Oh, let's not talk about school affairs now, Osgood. Walter... 
look at the mistletoe. Yeah. Look at it. Oh, now, just a minute. Before we go through all that again, uh, would you please touch that tree, Mr. Boynton? The one on the left with the... Why, it's gone. There's only one tree. Miss Brooks, are you all right? Of course I'm all right. Could I have jumped that part, too? Mr. Boynton, would you do me a favor, please? Well, of course, Miss Brooks. What is it? Would you touch the Christmas cake? Touch it? Please, but... it's important. Well, all right. There. Nothing happened. Well, what did you expect would happen? A miracle. Oh, excuse me, I'll be right back. Well, I'm a little urchin, and I'm selling magic Christmas trees. But you were just... Oh, please buy one, lady. They only cost 50 cents a piece. 50 cents? That's right. Here's two dollars. Give me four of them. <laughs> Armist Brooks, starring Eve Arden transcribed, was produced and directed by Larry Burns, written by Al Lewis with the music of Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Dick Crenna, Jane Morgan, Bob Rockwell, Gloria McMillan, Paula Winslow, Sammy Ogg, and Bill James. Be sure to be with us next week for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks.